Ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome to the Canada India Agritech Seminar. We are very excited to present this two day intensive event with the support of the Ministry of External Affairs, Economic Diplomacy, CII, and the Trade Commissioner Services Canada. We are privileged to have with us our chief guests, Honorable Minister Marie Claude Bibo. Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food, Government of Canada, Honorable Minister Narendra Singh Tomar, Minister of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare, Minister of Rural Development, Panchayati Raj, Minister of Food Processing Industries, Government of India. I would also like to welcome His Excellency Nadar Patel, High Commissioner of Canada to India, and His Excellency Ajay Bisarya, High Commissioner of India to Canada and thank you both for your presence here with us today. A warm welcome also to Ms. Alka Bhargava, Additional Secretary, Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers' Welfare, and Mr. P. Harish, Additional Secretary from the MEA ED. Before we proceed, uh, I would like to emphasize that this two-day seminar is a joint initiative based on the ch Chamber's effort over the past one year in putting together a value-based session on agriculture and technology and the huge potential that this sector has for the India-Canada Economic Corridor. In November 2019, at the ICBC National Convention, we held an exclusive roundtable with key players from the agricultural sector, many of whom are panelists and speakers today. In spite of the pandemic, food supply and agriculture have emerged as a critical focus area globally. And the importance of this subject is further strengthened by the fact that both the Honorable Ministers of Canada and India have graced us with their presence today. Some positive developments in, in India have been the recent policy reform announcements on the removal of stock limits and, lib and liberalization of sale of produce across the country. However, adoption of technology through digital platforms, AI, machine learning, is critical towards transforming India's agriculture, not to mention the impacts of climate change and the adoption of sustainable farming methods for future betterment. Canada is well equipped and has been early in adopting advanced technologies and transforming the traditional methods of agriculture and food supply, and therefore, tonight is an ideal platform for initiating dialogue between the two countries. I would now like to request Mr. Steel Singer, Member CII National Council and Chairman Emeritus PI Industries to give few brief welcome remarks before I invite Honorable Minister Bebo for her keynote address. Over to you, Mr. Singer. Nadira, you please continue. I think yes, okay. Mr. Singhal has some trouble connecting. Okay. Yeah. So, no problem. Uh, let me continue. Um, it, is my, it is my privilege to now request Honorable Mari Claude Bebo for her special address. Minister Bebo is the first woman in Canada's history to be appointed as Federal Minister of Agriculture and Agri-Food. She works with provinces, territories, and agricultural stakeholders to ensure the well-being of farming families. Last year, she launched the first ever Food Policy for Canada, which aims to strengthen food security for Canadians and to promote a thriving and sustainable food system in Canada. Besides her ministerial role, she's a proponent of women empowerment. Her commitment to the empowerment of women and girls internationally earned her the World Vision Voice of Children Award in 2019 and the CARE Global Leaders Network Humanitarian Award in 2018. Minister, we are honored to have you here with us. 
May I request you to address the seminar? Thank you. Thank you, Madam Abby. Uh, bonjour à tous et à toutes. I am pleased to be here with you today. My honorable colleague, Minister Thomas, our high commissioners and their teams, and agri-food business leaders from India and Canada. Thank you to the Indo-Canadian Business Chamber and our Trade Commissioner team for bringing us together today. This seminar is a great opportunity for us to explore ways to grow our bilateral trade and investment partnerships and to improve the competitiveness of our agriculture and food processing sectors. C'est une rencontre qui tombe à point, vu les pressions qui s'exercent sur nos systèmes alimentaires pendant la pandémie. Il est plus important que jamais de s'assurer que nos secteurs agricoles et agroalimentaires restent compétitifs et résilients. Our meeting is very timely, giving the pressures on our global food systems from the COVID pandemic. Our two nations have a proud history of strong bilateral trade and collaboration in agriculture. Over a century ago, a scientist at our research farm in Ottawa developed a new, a productive new variety of wheat that would earn Canada the reputation of the bread basket to the world. And to do that, he used a wheat variety from India. Today, our two nations enjoy a trading relationship in agriculture and agri-food that is valued at over $1.5 billion. Canada's growing trade with India is fueled by our strong ties, both business to business and people to people. Across Canada, there's a community of 1 million Indo-Canadians that enrich our land and our culture including some of my own colleagues, Canadian ministers. The relationship between our nations is strong, but we know there is room for growth, and that is why we are here today. These are exciting times to take advantage of new opportunities in joint ventures, technology transfers, and strategic alliances. In India, Rapid economic growth is driving new consumer demands and preferences. Canada can help India meet those demands through our scientific and technological expertise in food processing, food safety, and transportation infrastructure. L'Inde connaît une croissance économique rapide et le Canada peut l'aider à répondre aux nouvelles demandes des consommateurs. Nous avons une expertise scientifique et technologique à offrir dans les domaines de la transformation alimentaire, de la salubrité des aliments et des infrastructures de transport. As you know, Canada is a long-standing and trusted supplier of high-quality pulses to meet the needs of Indian consumers. We are now also making major investments to position Canada as a leader in a growing field of plant protein. We are growing our value-added processing capacity, not only for pulses, but other crops such as canola and soy. Our government launched the $153 million Protein Industry Supercluster, which matches public and private investments to develop exciting new products for plant protein. Investments in value-added innovation give farmers a new market for their crops while driving the creation of new jobs. For the world to benefit from the best crops and the best technologies available, we need to be able to trade on a level playing field. Canada continues to work hard through the G20 and the WTO to create a trading environment that is based, based in rules and science. Securing predictable market access for our world-class pulses to India remains a key priority for Canada. And free and predictable trade is also vital to strengthening global food security. This is a key way to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and especially the second one, zero hunger. When we talk about innovation today, more and more, 
we are talking about the kinds of technologies and practices that help our producers to be sustainable for the generations to come. Sustainability is a high priority for the Government of Canada, and it applies to the environment, the economy, and the well-being of our population. Je suis heureuse de savoir que vous allez explorer des possibilités de collaboration entre le Canada et l'Inde pour le développement de technologies agricoles durables. I'm pleased that you will be exploring how Canada and India can work together to develop sustainable agricultural technologies. Thanks to our continuing commitment and historic investments in agricultural innovation, Canada has established itself as a global leader in green technologies. To give you some examples, our farmers, men and women, now pinpoint the exact amount of fertilizer to use with precision agriculture, reduce the waste and optimize the efficiency of their operations with artificial intelligence and automation. Our producers are leading the way with data-driven technologies. These technologies can be powerful tools to help India increase production and the efficiency of their supply chains. Indeed, we know reducing food waste is key to, be, to being sustainable. Last week, the Food and Agriculture Organization marked the first ever International Day of Awareness of Food Loss and Waste. Globally, around 14% of food produced is lost between harvest and retail not including wastage that occurs at the retail and at the consumption level. In Canada alone, an estimated $50 billion in food is wasted every year. There are so many benefits to cutting food waste, reducing greenhouse, greenhouse gases, saving consumers money, strengthening food availability, and improving the efficiency of the agriculture and food sector. Action of food on food waste is part of Canada's first ever national food policy, which will offer incentives for companies to reduce food waste. Canada can also provide expertise in the area of handling and storage equipment in grain and other products to help the industry in India reduce losses and capture new opportunities. I know you will be learning about improvements to cold storage and other technologies, to reduce waste in the supply chain from farm to supermarket. Encore une fois, merci d'avoir organisé cette excellente occasion de réseautage. Vous contribuez à renforcer le partenariat agricole entre l'Inde et le Canada. So I am delighted that you have arranged this amazing networking opportunity to strengthen the agricultural partnership between India and Canada. I urge you to make full use of our Agricultural Trade Commissioner service. Our team can offer you support on the ground to expand your opportunities and meet the needs of your customers. As we look to the future, expanding and diversifying our mutual trade and investment opportunities and doing business based on rules and science will not only help our economies recover after the pandemic, it will also bring great benefits to both Canada and our partners in India while increasing food security for generations to come. I wish you all productive discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister Bebo, for those very enlightening and informative words. Uh, let me assure you that we will continue in our efforts to strengthen the agricultural business partnerships uh, between the two countries. As you said, innovative technology, sustainability, plant protein industry, logistics, storage. These are all relevant topics. And our uh, seminar over today and tomorrow has all these sessions. And we are encouraging Canadian and Indian companies to interact. And we, uh, we wish to develop a very strong business partnership between the two countries. So thank you very much for that. And uh, now it's my privilege to request Honorable Sri Narendra Singh Tomar, Minister of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. He also heads the Ministry of Rural Development, Panchayati Ra, Food Processing Industries. I would like to request Mr. P. Harish, Additional Secretary, Minister, Ministry of External Affairs, Economic Diplomacy, 
to formally call upon honorable minister for his address mananiya mantri ji tomar ji ka is karyakram mein hartik swagat karte hain aur ab shri p harish ji se aagrah karti hu ki ve shri man tomar ji ka sankship parichay de harish ji मिस्टर पी हरीश कैन यू प्लीज अनम्यूट मी इट्स अनम्यूटेड मिस्टर हरीश ओके थैंक यू आई हैव द ऑनर टू गिव एन इंट्रोडक्शन टू मिस्टर नरेंद्र सिंह तोमर जी द ऑनरेबल मिनिस्टर ऑफ एग्रीकल्चर एंड फार्मर्स वेलफेयर मिनिस्टर ऑफ रूरल डेवलपमेंट एंड पंचायती राज आर लोकल गवर्नमेंट इंस्टीट्यूशन and the minister of food processing industries uh, the honorable minister has had an illustrious political career and has several social and political achievements to his credit um, he is an agriculturalist by profession and uh, in appreciation of his dedicated service towards a nation he was awarded with the honor of outstanding minister in the year 2008 for his work as a cabinet minister in the government of the state of madhya pradesh in india he has had a continued involvement in the fields of chemicals and fertilizers and urban development uh, he has been a member of the parliamentary standing committee on chemicals and fertilizers and owing to his expertise and experience in the field of urban development he was also an esteemed member of the advisory committee to the ministry of urban development of the government of india in the previous government uh, minister uh, uh, tomar was appointed as a union minister of steel mines labor and employment and also handled the crucial portfolios of minister of mines and minister of parliamentary affairs in the government of india uh, minister tomar has had a, an illustrious uh, background during the last year leading the revolutionary uh, bills in parliament that has changed the face of agriculture and have been heralded as a 1991 reform movement for indian agriculture pranam sir main aapka आह्वान करता हूं कि आप संबोधित करें नमस्कार नमस्कार इंडो कैनेडियन बिजनेस चैम्बर सी और भारत के विदेश मंत्रालय द्वारा आयोजित भारत कनाडा एग्रीटेक सेमिनार में हम सब के मध्य उपस्थित कनाडा सरकार की माननीय कृषि एवं कृषि खाद्य मंत्री सुश्री मेरी क्लार्ड बीबू जी हमारे भारत में कनाडा के हाई कमिश्नर नादिर पटेल साहब कनाडा में भारत के हाई कमिश्नर श्री अजय विसारिया जी कृषि मंत्रालय की अतिरिक्त सचिव अलका भार्गव जी विदेश मंत्रालय के अतिरिक्त सचिव श्री पी हरीश जी श्री रविंदर पुरुषोत्तरम जी और सीईओ नादरा हामिद जी और उपस्थित सज्जनों आज भारत कनाडा एग्रीटेक सेमिनार को संबोधित करते हुए मुझे बहुत प्रसन्नता हो रही है यह सेमिनार उचित समय पर आयोजित किया जा रहा है क्योंकि भारत ने विशेष रूप से वैश्विक महामारी संकट के इन पाँच छः महीनों के दौरान कृषि क्षेत्र में प्रगतिशील सुधार किए हैं जिनमें स्वास्थ्य प्रोटोकॉल का दृढ़ता से पालन करते हुए सभी कृषि कार्यों को तय समय में पूरा किया गया है हाल ही में घोषित अनेक पहलों में वन नेशन वन मार्केट की स्थापना के लिए नीतिगत सुधार 86 परसेंट छोटे और सीमांत किसानों सहित अपने किसानों की सुरक्षा के उचित उपायों के साथ संविदा कृषि और लगभग 13 बिलियन अमेरिकी डॉलर का एग्री इंफ्रा फंड शामिल है हम ऑनलाइन मार्केट प्लेस व स्मार्ट एग्रीकल्चर के लिए 
महत्वपूर्ण प्रावधानकर्ता के रूप में डिजिटल एग्रो स्टैग विकसित कर रहे हैं सरकार हमारे कृषि क्षेत्र को निवेश के रूप में और निवेश को अवसर में बदलने के लिए पूरी तरह प्रतिबद्ध है It gives me immense pleasure to address this India Canada Agritech seminar. This seminar is being organized at an opportune moment as India made progressive reforms especially during these 5 6 months of pandemic crisis which saw all farming operations being completed in due time with strict adherence to health protocols. The recently announced initiatives included policy reforms for establishing a one nation one market contract farming with due safeguards for our farmers 86% of which are small and marginal and agri infra fund of about us dollar 13 billion we are developing a digital agri stack as a key enabler for online marketplaces and smart agriculture the government is committed to transform our agriculture sector into a go to investment opportunity aatmanirbhar bharat ke liye माननीय प्रधानमंत्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी का आभान एक चिर परिचित संकल्प है जिसे निवेश में वृद्धि तथा परिस्थिति के उन्नयन के द्वारा सशक्त किया जाएगा और परिणाम स्वरूप किसान उद्यमी बनेंगे तथा भारत विश्व की हेल्थ फूड बास्केट बनकर उभरेगा उत्कृष्ट भारतीय उपज के कारण कृषि उपज का निर्यात बाजार गत वित्त वर्ष में अड़तीस दशमलव चौवन बिलियन अमेरिकी डॉलर रहा है We call our honorable prime minister Modi for an atmanirbhar Bharat meaning self-reliant India will be strengthened by a self-reliant agriculture promised premised on enhanced investments and ecosystem upgrade transforming our farmers into entrepreneurs and making India the health food basket of the world with this Indian produce export market for agri produce to that us dollar 38.54 billion in the last financial year bharat apne vishal krishi anusandhan aur vyapak network ke sath jalvayu parivartan se utpann chunautiyon ka nirakaran karne ke liye taiyar hai dalhanon va bagwani sahit khadyanon mein record utpadan hasil karne ke baad hamare dhyan khadyan ki barbadi ko kam karne और किसानों की उचित आय सुनिश्चित करने के लिए आपूर्ति श्रृंखला के बेहतर प्रबंधन पर केंद्रित है एग्रीटेक क्षेत्र में भारत के 450 से अधिक स्टार्टअप्स हैं जिसका अर्थ है कि विश्व का प्रत्येक नौवा स्टार्टअप भारतीय है इस क्षेत्र के अनुरूप निवेश के कारण सार्वजनिक निजी भागीदारी में वृद्धि हुई है India with its vast agri research and extension network is geared to address the challenges being thrown up by climate change. Our focus is now on supply chain management for reducing food losses and waste and better prices to the farmers. India accounts for more than 450 plus startups in the agri tech space which translate to every ninth agri tech startup in the world being Indian. With commensurate investments coming in this sector there has been a rise in private public partnerships. आईटी के क्षेत्र में भारत की प्रगति के कारण प्रौद्योगिकी के, के समावेश से अन्य बातों के साथ साथ सटीक कृषि प्रोसेसिंग एग्रीकल्चर प्राकृतिक संसाधनों के सतत उपयोग सूचना की रियल टाइम उपलब्धता उत्पादकता वृद्धि हेतु यंत्रीकरण ऋण और संभवता विश्व के सबसे बड़े फसल बीमा कार्यक्रम की बेहतर डिलीवरी संभव हो पा रही है बिल्डिंग ऑन इंडिया स्प्रॉयस इन आईटी इंफ्यूजन ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी इज लीडिंग टू इंटर एरिया प्रोसीजन एग्रीकल्चर सस्टेनेबल यूज ऑफ नेचुरल रिसोर्सेज रियल टाइम एक्सेस टू इंफॉर्मेशन मैकेनाइजेशन फॉर इनहैंस प्रोडक्टिविटी क्रेडिट एंड इंप्रूव्ड डिलीवरी ऑफ परहैप्स द वर्ल्ड्स लार्जेस्ट क्रॉप इंश्योरेंस प्रोग्राम गत कुछ वर्षों में भारत कनाडा कृषि व्यापार में तीव्र वृद्धि हुई है भारत कनाडा की सब्जियों का पांचवा कृषि संबंधी कच्चे माल और शाकाहारी प्रोटीन कहलाने वाले लेग्यूमिनस सब्जियों का सातवां बड़ा सबसे बड़ा आयातक है भारत कनाडा कृषि व्यापार में वृद्धि की पर्याप्त संभावनाएं हैं भारत हेल्थ फूड के उत्पादन का एक श्रेष्ठ स्थान है जिसमें पोषक तत्व तो अनाज ऑर्गेनिक्स हर्बल्स आदि शामिल हैं 
जो आयुर्वेद की समृद्ध परंपराओं और योग उपचार विधियों के वाहक हैं इंडिया एग्रीकल्चर इंडिया कनाडा एग्रीकल्चर ट्रेड हैज ग्रोन रैपिडली ओवर द इयर्स इंडिया इज वन ऑफ द लार्जेस्ट इंपोर्टर ऑफ कैनेडियन वेजिटेबल्स एग्रीकल्चर रॉ मटेरियल्स एंड लेग्यूमिनस वेजिटेबल्स देयर इज अ ह्यूज पोटेंशियल फॉर ग्रोथ इन इंडिया कनाडा एग्रीकल्चर ट्रेड खाद्य प्रसंस्करण उद्योग भारत सरकार के प्रमुख क्षेत्रों में से एक है कोविड काल में जैविक स्वास्थ्यवर्धक व प्रसंस्कृत खाद्य की वैश्विक मांग में वृद्धि हुई है भारत में पारिस्थितिक क्षेत्र की विविधताओं के कारण विभिन्न प्रकार की उत्पादन प्रणालियां संभव हैं जिससे समुद्री मछलियों फलों तथा सब्जियों एवं तत्काल खाने योग्य उत्पादों जैसे चिन्हित क्षेत्रों में अनुकूल आर्थिक नीतियों और आकर्षक राजकोषीय प्रोत्साहनों के माध्यम से खाद्य खुदरा क्षेत्र में निवेश के विशाल अवसर उपलब्ध होते हैं हमारे मेगा फूड पार्क में सैंतीस फूड पार्क मंजूर किए हैं जिनमें से 20 कार्यरत हैं आशा है 2024 तक खाद्य प्रसंस्करण उद्योग में 33 बिलियन अमेरिकी डॉलर का निवेश आकर्षित होगा और वर्ष 2025 तक भारत में इस क्षेत्र में इस निवेश के आधा ट्रिलियन डॉलर से अधिक होने की संभावना है इतना ही नहीं हमारे प्रगतिशील आर्थिक विकास और जीवन स्तर के उन्नयन को देखते हुए 2030 तक भारतीय घरेलू उत्पाद में संभावित वृद्धि भारत को विश्व के पांचवें सबसे बड़े उपभोक्ता के पायदान पर खड़ी करेगी फूड प्रोसेसिंग इंडस्ट्री इज आइडेंटिफाइड एज वन ऑफ द चैंपियन सेक्टर्स बाय गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया कोविड टाइम्स हैव सीन ए सर्ज इन ग्लोबल डिमांड फॉर ऑर्गेनिक हेल्थ फोर्टिफाइड एंड प्रोसेस्ड फूड बिल्डिंग ऑन आवर रिच ट्रेडिशंस ऑफ आयुर्वेदा एंड योगिक वे ऑफ हीलिंग इंडिया इंडिया डाइवर्स एग्रो इकोलॉजिकल जोन्स सपोर्ट ए रेंज ऑफ प्रोडक्शन सिस्टम्स ऑफरिंग ह्यूज अपॉर्चुनिटीज फॉर इन्वेस्टमेंट्स इन द फूड रिटेल सेक्टर बाय बिल्डिंग ए सपोर्टिव इकोसिस्टम एंड फिजिकल इंसेंटिव्स इन आइडेंटिफाइड सेगमेंट्स लाइक मरीन फिशरीज फ्रूट्स एंड वेजिटेबल्स एंड रेडी टू ईट प्रोडक्ट्स 37 फूड पार्क्स हैव बीन सैंक्शनड अंडर आवर मेगा फूड पार्क प्रोग्राम ऑफ व्हिच 19 आर ऑलरेडी ऑपरेशनल industry estimates spec investments worth us dollar 33 billion in the indian food processing industry by 2024 and being worth over half a trillion dollar by 2020 2025 by 2030 given our increasing economic growth and consequent standard of living indian household consumption will position india as the fifth largest consumer in the world hum saat sutri केंद्रित रणनीति के माध्यम से वर्ष 2022 तक अपने किसानों की आय को दोगुना करने के माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के विजन को पूरा करने की दिशा में काम कर रहे हैं हमारी उपयुक्त नीति के माध्यम से वैश्विक मूल्य श्रृंखलाओं के साथ विश्व कृषि निर्यात में भारत की हिस्सेदारी दोगुनी करने और भारत को कृषि क्षेत्र की एक वैश्विक शक्ति बनाने का प्रयास कर रहे हैं एक ऐसा देश जो न केवल सभी के लिए खाद उपलब्धता सुनिश्चित करेगा बल्कि अपनी आवश्यकताओं की पूर्ति करते हुए सरप्लस की स्थिति भी प्राप्त करेगा we strive to make india a global power in agriculture by integrating with the global value chain through suitable policy instruments mujhe aasha hai ki varsh 2009 mein samjhota gyapan aur hastakshar ke pashchat bharat kanada sahyog krishi kshetra mein apni prakritik kshamtaon ka labh uthane ke liye apni sampurna shakti ke sath agrasar hoga main is do divasiya सेमिनार में सार्थक विचार विमर्श की कामना करता हूं जय हिंद आई एम होपफुल दैट इंडिया कनाडा कोलैबोरेशन कमेंसिंग विद द साइनिंग ऑफ द एमओयू इन 2009 विल गो फ्रॉम स्ट्रेंथ टू स्ट्रेंथ फॉर लिबरेटिंग आवर नेचुरल स्ट्रेंथ इन एग्री सेक्टर आई विश द एक्सचेंज ऑफ आइडियाज इन दिस टू डे सेमिनार ऑल द सक्सेस थैंक यू एंड जय हिंद
धन्यवाद श्रीमान तोमर जी मैं तह दिल से आपका आभार मानती हूँ कि आपने अपना कीमती समय इस कार्यक्रम को दिया और आप हम सब के बीच पधारे आपका सहयोग और मार्गदर्शन आगे भी हम सभी को मिलता रहे यही आग्रह है और इंडिया और कनाडा का हम व्यापार रिलेशनशिप बिजनेस रिलेशनशिप आगे बढ़ाएंगे ये मैं आपको अश्योरेंस देती हूँ इसके साथ um i would also like to thank minister bibo for her time uh, to be with us here today thank you to both the ministers and now i would like to call upon mr salil singhal uh, who, who has joined us to say a few words over to you mr singhal thank you nadira uh, honorable minister mari claude bibo the minister for agriculture and agri food government of canada Uh, Manani and Narin Singh Ji Tomar, our Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, Development, Rural Development and Food Processing Industries, Sir, आपका बहुत-बहुत स्वागत है इस कार्यक्रम में. Your Excellency Nadir Patel, our High Commissioner in India and Canada, Excellency Ajay Bisaria, our High Commissioner in Canada, uh, Ms. Alka Ji Bhargav, our Additional Secretary. Mr. P. Harish, our additional secretary for, and Nadira, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to address uh, this conference. India and Canada bilateral bilateral relations have transformed in recent years, strengthened by our shared values of democracy, diversity, and people-to-people -people ties. Though increased national and regional collaborations. the capacity for an enhanced indo-canadian strategic economic partnership is much larger than what is currently being portrayed india is canada's ninth largest export market and 10th largest trading partner with a with a turnover of almost 10 billion dollars with india's exports being uh, 4.4 and canadian imports being 5.48 billion into india the 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 imports of uh, goods has been to the tune of 3.756 billion dollars and the services we imported 1.7.2 billion and canada exported 1.3 billion since the visit of the honorable prime minister trudeau in india in 2018 several important initiatives have launched in we launched including indo canadian collaboration on intellectual property rights sustainable development and security and research cooperation today indian corporate presence in canada is growing whether it is through greenfield ventures organic growth or mergers and acquisitions indian investments are primarily in the se sectors of technology life sciences pharmaceuticals minerals and metals petrochemicals automotive oil and gas and also financial services canadian companies are also thriving in india and have made inroads in sectors including agriculture and food processing power and energy equipment and services oil and gas environmental products and services telecommunications information technology financial sectors and of course including insurance this conversation today is focused on how agri technologies have reshaped agriculture globally and the relevance and significant in enhancing partnership between our two countries both india and canada are witnessing in flux of technology solutions that is transforming the entire value chain from farm to fork the farmers as well as the agri industry are embracing the transformation and using technology as a resource to make agriculture a sustainable scalable and resilient sector particularly when we see huge impact of the climate change and related factors so building resilience is of the most critical importance in agriculture the solutions being offered are diverse and available at each step of the value chain also with the startups working directly with farmers empowering them and making the sector more profitable the ecosystem for technology and digital solutions is expands is expanding at an impressive pace 
As far as India is concerned, digital analytics solutions have gained a lot of traction and are helping make farming an insight-driven occupation. Efforts have been made towards digitizing an existing value chain. Technological interventions based on remote sensing, soil sensors, unmanned, unmanned aerial surveying, and market insights have provided us with several data points that is in combination with robust artificial intelligence, machine learnings, algorithms, generate actionable insights. The landscape uh, Mr. is- Mr. Singhal? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Singhal, if you could, uh, uh, Minister Tomar has a flight to catch and has to leave. Uh, okay. So, so I'm very pleased leave. that, uh, sir, you are here. And I'm sure that in the industry, we will be able to see a lot of co coordination between in these advanced technology and agriculture program. Sir, I want to tell you that this is the ICBC program. इससे हमारी जो टेक्नोलॉजिकल स्ट्रेंथ हम एक दूसरे को दे सकेंगे वो इस कार्यक्रम से आएगी और आपके हमारे यहां होने से हम एक बहुत बड़ा इसका प्रोत्साहन मिलता है कि इस काम को सुचारू रूप से कर सकेंगे कृषि में भारत ने बहुत उन्नति की है और आपके नेतृत्व में और नई टेक्नोलॉजीज के साथ हम बहुत आगे प्रोग्रेस करेंगे मैडम मिनिस्टर वी आर थैंकफुल टू यू फॉर बीइंग हियर and I wish this whole program a grand success. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Singhal, for, all, for those words. Uh, I would now like to welcome His Excellency Nadir Patel, High Commissioner of Canada to India, to speak. High Commissioner Patel is a dynamic representative of Canada and has been instrumental in several Canada-India initiatives. During his tenure as High Commissioner to India, the bilateral trade and investment figures have grown extensively. It is my privilege to call upon High Commissioner Patel to deliver his address in this important area of agri-tech collaboration between India and Canada. Over to you, High, High Commissioner. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nadira, and uh, such a, a pleasure and a privilege to be here to be able to offer up some remarks at this inaugural session. First, I'll just acknowledge the uh, the uh, comments by uh, Minister Tomar, Minister Bibo. A really great way to kick off uh, this uh, today uh, seminar, but also very very telling. Uh, their participation shows how critical an area of opportunity and collaboration the agritech sector is. So we're very, very delighted to have heard from uh, those ministers. Let me also once again acknowledge um, my colleague and my counterpart in Canada, His Excellency Ajib Bissaria, uh, who's doing incredible work advancing the India relationship in Canada. And I really enjoy working with uh, Ajay. So we're happy to uh, be able to share some opportunities uh, or comments on opportunities here today as well. And of course, um, once again, ICBC, thank you very much. I, I thank you very much for your leadership in bringing this uh, important session together, along with some very distinguished uh, colleagues from the government of India, which we'll hear from in just a moment. Um, I wanted to start off by just uh, sharing a couple of um, informal thoughts. You know, the relationship between Canada and India continues to grow at a very robust pace. And, um, you know, one comment I make very regularly is how we continue to hit record numbers across all metrics um, in the commercial relationship. Um, the pandemic, of course, has created challenges, challenges for India, challenges for Canada and other countries around the world. And there has never been a more important time for us to uh, look at new ways of collaborating as two different countries. And we talk about shockproofing our economies and looking at ways in which we can ensure food security for our citizens um, we, we conclude that we can do much more together, Canada and India, than we could if we went it alone. And so one thing that we've been doing over the last little while with respect to navigating through these difficult times is looking at ways in which we could uh, expand into new sectors of cooperation or build beyond what it is that we've been doing. And the agri-food, agricultural ecosystem as it relates to Canada-India uh, commercial relations has been very robust. But it has largely been focused on, you know, uh, agri-food exports both ways, imports, exports, fertilizers, the broader ecosystem. And as our ministers both touched on in different ways, there's so much more 
to the relationship so much more that we can tap into, which is why I'm very, very delighted that ICBC and CII have come together with this seminar focused on agricultural technology, which for me um, is one of those few areas where we see so much more potential to build on the uh, on the uh, on the uh, annual relationship that we have. And um, so let me just offer up a, a few uh, specific uh, remarks uh, on that. Um, you know, I think um, our mutually beneficial relationship in this agricultural sector right now is worth over one and a half billion dollars annually in relation to bilateral trade of a variety of commodities uh and such as grains and pulses and spices and tea and coffee and seafood whatever it might be but the untapped potential to grow this relationship um includes the number of areas that our ministers touched on but i think is grounded in agricultural technologies that subsector has the potential to amplify so much more that we could do partly because of recent advancements and innovations in this field in both countries and we just heard minister tomar talk a little bit about that with respect to the startup ecosystem among other things as well but also because of two-way engagement where both countries are already active both countries have common interests and both countries can learn from each other's successes and challenges as well let me just touch briefly on some of the agri-tech uh, advancements in canada we in canada face several challenges in agriculture, such as a relatively short growing season, relatively higher labor costs and a labor shortage, climate change, the declining interest among uh, a new generation for farming as a career option. To tackle some of these challenges, Canada has invested in areas such as hydroponics, robotic tractors, grain handling and storage systems and technologies to automate operations on large farms. In fact, some of these innovative companies uh, that are using these technologies are already operating in India, but certainly have room to do so much more and grow. As the fifth largest agricultural exporter in the world with $56 billion in sales, momentum from international trade is driving Canadian ag tech to the forefront of new technologies. As part of the five-year Canadian agricultural partnership launched in 2018, Federal, provincial, and territorial governments have invested over $3 billion to strengthen the agriculture and agri-food sector, and much of this is underpinned by investments in technology. Under this program, Canada is looking to promote agricultural innovations such as new crop varieties, livestock breeds, nutrient management practices, tilling methods, and farm machinery, as well as advancements in biotechnology, precision agriculture, and communication and information technologies. In the middle of last year, Canada announced further investments of around $80 million to establish two Canadian networks focused on ag tech itself, Canadian Food Innovators and Canadian Agri-Food Automation and Intelligence Network. These technologies and best practices arising from these platforms will provide significant opportunities for further strengthening the Canada-India bilateral cooperation in the agri tech sector. Now, recent trends and innovations from Canada some of them include and can act as areas of potential collaboration here with India, especially in the food production and processing subsector um, and, and uh, another area that will be touched on throughout the seminar today and tomorrow. Let me just give you a couple of examples. Use of digital technologies for automation, such as drones, remote sensing, robots, to increase productivity and streamline harvest, post-harvest operations. Modeling through software and artificial intelligence machine learning applications to predict crop opportunities, management inputs and market trends. And of course, Canada has one of the most advanced artificial intelligence ecosystems in the world. And much of that can be leveraged to apply to technologies in this space. The use of innovative processing technologies for value addition, such as trends in health preferences and plant-based alternative uh, meats as well. Let me just touch briefly on Protein Industries Canada, one of the other important initiatives in Canada with great implications for Canada-India relations is our Plant Protein Supercluster Initiative, Protein Industries Canada. It's a great example of the innovative focus on alternative sources of protein to feed a growing world. Now, this uh, supercluster, Protein Industries Canada, will invest more than $150 million over the next four years into projects that will drive innovation in this field. 
Let me just close on a couple of words about Canada's ag tech initiatives in India. Again, you'll hear from some of the companies that are involved in this space throughout today and tomorrow. Um, here in India, the High Commission has engaged in several ag tech initiatives. Earlier this year, we hosted a trade delegation to India to promote partnerships in technology for agriculture and supply chains. Four Canadian companies visited Mumbai and Bangalore to meet with potential partners. Today's seminar is a great platform for new ideas in Canada-India bilateral collaboration in ag tech, thanks to a number of important partners, Government of India, Chambers coming together collaboratively, put our heads together around best practices along with industry leaders as well. Um, farming and cold storage logistics is another area where we're actively engaged here in India. And later this month, uh, towards the end of October, we'll be participating in the Agro and Food Tech 2020 to connect with Indian ag tech companies and showcase recent tangible innovations in Canada. So given the solid foundation of the Canada-India bilateral relationship, the multifaceted growth in the agriculture sector, there's no doubt tremendous scope to further enhance our engagement in this sector. And I believe technology underpins that growth. With new technology emerging at such a rapid pace and innovations driving agricultural operations in Canada and in India, it's only natural that both our countries should further enhance collaboration in the ag tech sector. And this seminar and the high level of engagement from both governments, ministers, as I said earlier, is a testimony to the interest and the opportunities on both sides. As Minister Bibo indicated, Canada's Trade Commissioner Service in India, including an agricultural Agriculture Canada team, is committed to take this momentum forward, not only through today's uh, seminar, but well into the uh, future as well. So I certainly look forward to hearing some interesting feedback from today and tomorrow's session. And I wish all participants a hugely successful conference. Thank you once again for this opportunity for Canada to be part of this and share a few remarks. Back over to you, uh, Nadira, and uh, thank you again. Uh, thank you, High Commissioner. And as I thank you, High Commissioner and, uh, Patel, and invite High Commissioner Ajay Basaria, I think this is a very opportune time uh, for me to announce, uh, seeing that both you and uh, Mr. Basaria are such uh, strong advocates for the sector and to develop this and consider this sector to be a sunrise sector for uh, trade and business opportunities between India and Canada. Uh, I think this is an opportune time to announce that ICBC would be publishing a white paper report on agri-tech opportunities, both tapped and untapped potential for business opportunities between the two countries. And uh, you know, and we are very happy that this session, both today and tomorrow, will be a basis on which we begin work on the white paper report. So with that, I would now like to welcome and introduce His Excellency Ajay Bisaria, High Commissioner of India to Canada. Since joining the mission in Canada earlier this year, High Commissioner Bisaria has been instrumental in the bilateral crisis management efforts. His foreign policy, trade and investment expertise is crucial during these difficult times, especially with regard to food security and ag tech partnerships for the future. He, along with High, His Excellency Nagar Patel, who just spoke, are strong advocates of ag tech initiatives as one of the sunrise sectors in the India-Canada trade corridor. Your Excellency, may I request you to please give your remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Nadiraji. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank um, the two ministers uh, for uh, being available and congratulations to you for getting them together for this uh, virtually a virtual summit uh, of uh, the two uh, agriculture ministers in one forum. And that was really something uh, wonderful to see and to benefit from. Um, I also want to acknowledge um, uh, Mr. Salil Singhal, who spoke on uh, behalf of industry from CII, and of course, my friend and counterpart, uh, Nadir Patel, for all your uh, words and your wisdom of six years. My mine uh, experience is six months, yours is six years, so uh, it's, uh, we, I always defer to his uh, expertise in this relationship. And thank you for all the wonderful initiatives your High Commission in Delhi is taking, particularly in the ag tech sector. 
I want also want to greet my colleagues, um, uh, Ms. Alka Bhargav, additional secretary in agriculture, and Mr. Harish, uh, additional secretary in uh, in external affairs. So it's it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this uh, summit uh, where uh, we had uh, the two ministers kick off uh, the discussion with uh, such a fine focused uh, presentations on the state of Indian agriculture and uh, Canadian agriculture. Am I audible? Mr. Basadia. Yes. Okay, uh, I just lost the screen for a moment. Okay, so uh, it, it's wonderful to be part of uh, this conversation uh, when both our countries are focusing clearly on food security uh, at a time of this pandemic where health security and food security are uh, critical drivers. And I think uh, the, uh, the conversation is very timely, particularly because India is focusing on uh, on uh, this uh, on agriculture reforms in the recent past we are talking of a 1991 moment uh, of unleashing the potential of agriculture and i think this transformative moment of uh, on indian agriculture certainly needs uh, technology to drive it and this is a great conversation to have the two ministers have already painted a, a picture of the critical developments in uh, agriculture in both countries, and uh, I think they've underlined in many ways the synergies uh, that are possible. If we look at Indian agriculture, uh, we uh, have, of course, uh, the largest agricultural land area in the world with around 55% of households making their uh, living from agriculture. Yet this sector contributes only 18% of the GDP and that's exactly uh, the room which we uh, see for technological change, for harnessing agricultural technology to increase productivity and to trigger growth. And we've heard the minister talk about the ambition India has to double farm income by uh, 2022. So this is a, a, a vote for accelerating this uh, change that we need to bring in agriculture. Given the technical developments across the world, India, in fact, has an opportunity to leapfrog in uh, agricultural technologies using the latest available, uh, whether for sustainable agriculture, waste reduction, efficient supply chains, food pro processing, plant protein management. I think all these need us to leapfrog into the latest, latest cutting edge technologies. We've already heard of new age methods that can modernize agricultural practices, enhance productivity through precision agriculture, a special category of ag tech through machines and equipment that use data analytics, Internet of Things, robotics to optimize inputs and enhance yields. And as we've seen, this process is already on. Uh, the minister mentioned how uh, we wish to bring through this revolution uh, a change which make farmers into entrepreneurs. We already talked of the 450 startups in the agri-tech space, and they raised uh, uh, more than $250 million in 2019, uh, according to a NASCOM report. So India both has a vast potential and a huge appetite to absorb these new technologies to enhance our uh, production and growth. Uh, coming to India and Canada, uh, Nadir has already outlined um, some of the huge opportunities uh, that uh, that lay out before us. Uh, I had the opportunity to visit a couple of weeks ago Saskatchewan, which is the agricultural heart in the prairies of Canada, and it certainly uh, opened my eyes to the huge potential we have and the scope for enhancing our cooperation. For instance, the University of Saskatoon uh, has the Crop Development Research Centre, which has multiple technologies uh, and production, uh, you know, for uh, agriculture, which is of great interest to us. We already started a conversation with them. Uh, so Canada, I think, is a natural partner for India, not just because it's a strategic partner, but specifically uh, in the agricultural space. And if there's one takeaway I have from the conversations that the two uh, ministers had and uh, what we've heard before, 
it's that we need to move from trade uh, to technology. Trade is great. We have uh, uh, $500 million of uh, agriculture and forestry products which were imported by India, but we need to move uh, towards technology. And uh, on pulses, we've heard that India is already a major importer of uh, pulses. And uh, but, you know, the market tends to be uncertain because of the monsoon dependence of Indian agriculture. And that also makes the argument towards moving on an ag tech based cooperation on pulses, where uh, we move into the space we've been discussing of protein rich protein enhancement and using the uh, plant protein expertise that uh, Canada has. Uh, so I, I would say that the technology that could be uh, of interest to us is already well defined uh, to serve our objectives of increasing crop production, improving nutritional value of crops, facilitating crop and soil monitoring, uh, reducing input prices for farmers. And there are several other areas, including improving the overall process driven supply chain, the agri mapping of commodities, uh, optimizing procurement, reducing wastage and making uh, farm mechanization available. But what we've heard today is that in all these sectors, we have te technological uh, uh, capabilities and expertise available in Canada with our Canadian partners and also in the newer areas of digital agriculture, uh, which uh, what we have available is precision agriculture technology, including data driven predictive technologies to forecast uh, climate conditions, water quantity management for irrigation and artificial intelligence, as well as the Internet of Things for agriculture and supply chains. I think we're going to be hearing these words more and more in the next uh, couple of days. But these are certainly huge opportunities uh, and we'll be happy to work uh, at the High Commission with uh, our counterparts in Delhi and uh, with through our consulates in Vancouver and Toronto in identifying these technologies and uh, bringing them uh, to uh, Indian agriculture, either through coordination with universities or companies uh, in whichever way is feasible. I think the point I wanted to end with is that there is also an organic connection with uh, between Indian and uh, Canadian agriculture, and that is the huge community of 1.6 million Indo-Canadians, many of whom come from Punjab, and many of whom I've spoken to who are working at the cutting edge of agriculture in Canada, whether in cranberries or pulses or wheat or uh, dairy farming. And I think that also becomes a natural constituency to take this forward. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I wish all success to this wonderful conference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, High Commissioner. As you said, the future of business partnership between India and Canada uh, lies in ag tech uh, based business partnerships. So it is, as you said, from trade to technology is what we are looking at and what the sessions are going to focus upon. Um, with this, I would now like to welcome Dr. Alka Bharga. She is additional secretary at the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare. And it would be of great value to all of us here to hear her views on maintaining a balance between the agri ecosystem and, the, and economic development. Over, you, over to you, Dr. Bhargav. Uh, Dr. Alka Bhargav, may I invite you to speak? Um, Shavik, uh, could you please uh, check whether her mic is on? Kindly unmute. Uh, in the meantime, should I, uh, Mr. Harish, with your permission, maybe probably um, invite you to speak first and then uh, as soon as Dr. Bhargav is able to join, then she could give her remarks. Okay, so as not to lose time, we are already uh, touching that. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for uh, uh, your efforts in making this possible. 
Uh, we are very thankful to both the ministers, um, Minister Bibhav and Minister Narendra Singh Tomo, for making their valuable time available to us today. Uh, greetings to both the High Commissioners, Nadir Patel and Ajay Bisaria, for their time and for their uh, comments. Um, Alka Bhargavaji, Additional Secretary from Agri-Ministry, is here. Uh, Mr. Salil Singhal, for your comments representing CII and the Indian industry. Uh, and finally, to the uh, ICBC, I want to really uh, uh, convey my uh, deep appreciation to ICBC and the CII for jointly organizing this and for taking forward this initiative. As uh, um, Minister Tomer uh, explained, we are at a critical moment in Indian agriculture. Um, over 55% of our population depends on agriculture and its contribution to the national GDP is less than 20%. The effort is not only to enhance the overall contribution of agriculture to a GDP, but also uh, uh, to ensure that our farmers' incomes in tune with our Prime Minister's vision uh, are doubled by the year 2022. Along with that, as Minister Tomer explained, there has been a huge push for agri-reforms, a 91 moment, so to speak, for agriculture, freeing up, giving more choices to the farmer to be able to source inputs and to find markets for their uh, output. Also, an opportunity for the farming sector to look at market signals and to hear market signals, and accordingly, uh, uh, the government has put in place a legal framework for contract farming, giving more options to the farmers. Uh, along with this, sustainability is a very important factor. Uh, mitigating the impact of a changing climate on agriculture is very important because agriculture in India, especially rain-fed agriculture, has traditionally been dependent on the vagaries of the Indian monsoon. Uh, so there have been a significant focus on climate-resilient agriculture, devising appropriate adaptation strategies for food security, uh, enhanced livelihood opportunities, and economic stability. Um, I think um, one of the core reasons why uh, we at Economic Diplomacy in the Ministry of uh, Economic uh, in the Ministry of External Affairs of India have focused on is to look at the whole issue of uh, sustainability, uh, agricultural engagement with Canada, and nutritional security. Uh, I think one issue uh, that we have to keep in mind in India is that there is uh, 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 prevalence of um, uh, nutritional insecurity in parts of India. At the same time, when incomes rise, we also notice a concomitant movement from consumption of plant protein to animal protein. Uh, however, during the medium and long term, if more uh, uh, people in India with rising incomes start uh, adhering to this trend of shifting from plant protein to animal protein, that may put a larger question mark on sustainability. Hence, the focus on ensuring nutritional security for those who are nutritionally insecure, and giving better options for consumption of plant protein in different formats and in a better bioavailable format to enhance their nutritional security for Indians who are uh, moving up the income chain, whose incomes are growing. I think this was the beginning of the uh, conversation we have had with our Canadian uh, counterparts in industry and with the government uh, since the last uh, year, year and a half. Based on this, we have been able to, uh, in, with the cooperation of the Canadian government, uh, the High Commission here and the High Commissioner, we have been able to arrange business visits and exchanges. Uh, but again, uh, uh, we've even had high-level endorsement of this uh, during uh, last year, uh, during the annual uh, uh, program that ICBC does. Um, we have had the former Prime Minister come and address. We have had ministers from provinces. Um, including Alberta and Saskatchewan, who came and who talked about the need uh, for having our agricultural uh, uh, engagement on a more firmer footing. Uh, one of the reasons they said was there was an annual change uh, in the trade in pulses, hence the need to ensure uh, greater sustainability in our agricultural engagement, which moves away only from pulses and other agri-commodity trade to a focus on manufacturing with a focus on uh, uh, plant protein. We believe that the current industrial climate, especially in the food processing sector, is an opportune moment for Canadian businesses to look at investing in the plant protein industry in India, uh, not only for domestic consumers, but using India as a manufacturing base for plant protein products uh, for the whole world. I think this engagement and this opportunity for investment in India for Canadian businesses 
is a perfect opportunity to bring greater sustainability in our agri uh, engagement. And uh, we believe uh, that with the, a forum like this, which brings together business and industry, brings together investors, uh, and organizations like Invest India will be a, a good platform to ensure that all interested stakeholders can meet at one place. I think uh, um, um, our aim is to bring in important private sector stakeholders and uh, technology developers from Canada and put them in touch with, uh, uh, with, with potential partners in India. We want to attract greater investment in all aspects of the value chain, from farm to market, uh, to be able to bring in new agricultural technologies um, uh, to, to aid in efficient management of resources for making our value chains more traceable and coordinated, uh, create highly productive and adaptable agricultural systems, uh, which can lead to greater food security, uh, nutritional security, profitability, and sustainability. I think uh, a, a robust agri relationship between our two countries is mutually beneficial to us. I'm thankful to the uh, Canadian minister for pointing out that the wheat uh, revolution in Canada began from a genetic resource that was from India. This was new information to us, uh, to me at least, which, was, uh, which I did not know before. So I think uh, uh, the time is also ripe for us to benefit from uh, agri-tech, uh, um, um, I think, uh, innovations that Canada has brought about and to look at where else we can move uh, um, into, into soya bean, into oil seeds. These are all sectors with great potential in India and where technology from Canada can make a huge difference in, in, in productivity and uh, in the food processing industry. Uh, I uh, look forward to very substantive discussions during the course uh, of today and tomorrow. And uh, uh, we hope, and I really want to applaud the ICBC for coming up with this concept of a white paper on this. Uh, we look forward uh, to uh, that acting as a spur, to uh, acting as a great impetus for further enhancing our collaboration in this sector. And I'm confident our uh, missions, our two high commissioners, will uh, uh, lead this effort at both ends of the spectrum uh, so that we can see uh, greater engagement between our uh, business and industry on this. Uh, and I look forward to a very fruitful discussion. Thank you, Nadiraji. And uh, now I hope uh, we were able to address uh, the uh, technical glitch uh, at uh, Alkaji's end. Yes, thank you, Mr. Harish. Uh, technology brings opportunities, also some problems and glitches of its own, which we, were, which we have managed to overcome. Uh, but before I hand it over to uh, Dr. Alka Bhargava, I would like to thank you, Mr. Harish. It is due to your support that we have managed to put this event together. So thank you, and we look forward to the, both the days of discussion and then working further ahead. Uh, Dr. Alka Bhargav, may I please invite you now to deliver your remarks. Yeah, thank you so much. Am I audible now? Yes, very well. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, His, uh, His Excellency High Commissioner Nadir Patel, His Excellency High Commissioner Ajay Bisaria, Additional Secretary P. Harish, Mr. Salil Singhal, distinguished participants from Canada, officials from CII and ICBC. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, I'm extremely grateful to our Honorable Ministers of Canada and India for being with us today. And it is indeed a pleasure to be part of the Agritech Summit and a seminar to discuss and deliberate on opportunities arising from our respective areas of forte in emerging agri-value chains and help forge deeper partnerships between India and Canada. And uh, I remember the conversations which we often had uh, when uh, High Commissioner Canada visited Rishi Bhavan of moving beyond trade, and that's exactly what we're talking about today. So India and Canada share strong bilateral ties, uh, strengthened by shared values of parliamentary democracy, expanding economic engagements, regular high-level interactions, and long people-to-people -people cultural ties, which were also referred to by Honorable Minister from Canada. In the agriculture sector, we have an institutional mechanism of the MOU signed in 2009 for cooperation in agriculture and allied sectors including knowledge exchange on emerging technologies. Regular meetings of the JWG have been taking place, and the last one being in 2017, and hence probably we may plan the next virtual meeting in the present circumstances to carry on the ideas which would be generated in this two-day brainstorming. Agriculture, as has been discussed today and repeatedly said, is a high priority sector for India, considering the dependence of majority of our population for livelihoods and contribution to the GDP. Despite the various challenges, including that of climate change and other vagaries of nature, production has been on the rise. 
greens touching 274 million metric tons and horticulture 313 metric million metric tons in 2019-20 the current year has been specially challenging in view of the covid pandemic cyclones and is the locust attack for a second consecutive year but as everyone knows i am i'm proud to share that india emerged stronger therefrom as we mobilized a vast administrative and technical machinery with supportive policies and programs to maintain continuity of supply chains innovations and infusion of technology made us self sufficient within a matter of months only in testing equipment etc directly related to fighting the crisis and similarly so in the agri space a sector which is as important as the health concerns in keeping everyone well fed to boost immunity and ensuring livelihoods for the farmer producers with the addition of farmers welfare in the very name of my ministry of agriculture in 2014 and comfortable levels of production there has been a shift in focus from a production oriented approach to an income oriented one the seven prong strategy mentioned by honorable agriculture minister for achieving the vision of our prime minister of doubling farmers income are basically increasing crop productivity improving livestock productivity reducing cost of inputs increase in cropping intensity diversification towards high value crops improvement in real prices received by farmers and shift from farm to non farm uh, occupations at the outset i would briefly touch upon the two farming acts which were promulgated through an ordinance on 5th june this year and passed by parliament last month since these have caught the attention like none other in recent times the first one is the farmer produce trade and commerce promotion and facilitation ordinance 2020 uh, act sorry act 2020 which aims to create a one nation one agri market giving the farmers and traders more options from where and where and how to sell or or to buy earlier under the apmc acts of the states the farmers could sell the produce only in the nearest wholesale mandi due to the extent laws as well as less knowledge of prices in nearby markets this situation was changed to a large extent through our electronic national agriculture market platform launched in 2016 which started providing information on prices in other markets and giving options of selling from warehouses etc to the farmers now this new act opens up the possibilities for seamless intra and interstate trading beyond the physical boundaries of the mandis the farmers empowerment and protection agreement on price assurance and farm services act which in short can be said to be a legal framework for contract farming agreements between farmers and the sponsors would be a kind of a win win for both parties in the sense the farmers are assured of the price and the buyer for the produce and the buyer the industry gets stuff of the quantity and quality required an important component that could form part of the agreement is the provision of farm services to the farmers and here in lies relevance of discussions in this two day seminar infusion of technology by way of appropriate planting material agronomic practices for improved yields through sustainable use of natural resources these two acts together with the amendment to our essential commodities act set in place the right ecosystem for attracting private investment in direct marketing establishing cold chains and warehouses processing organized retail and exports as a natural corollary precision farming or smart agriculture even in small and marginal farm farms including micro irrigation systems under a ppp mode is one of many such activities that are on the anvil but with the bottom line the land titles remain unchanged in favor of the farmer this changed mode of farming is also strengthened by the renewed support to farm collectives especially the farmer producer organizations and the cooperatives with bumper harvest every year this year too with a great monsoon for the second consecutive year ground tab water tables are recharged major reservoirs being 14% more full than the last 10 years average the acreage sown has gone up in spite of all the uh, the constraints because of the pandemic we look forward to yet another bumper winter crop over the present uh, kharif uh, monsoon harvesting underway so the gears have shifted to improve post harvest management value addition and processing the country as mentioned by honorable minister has embarked on a mission of atmanirbhar krishi self sustaining agriculture to contribute to the big picture of an atmanirbhar bharat or self reliant india capitulating on Uh, local strengths of our rich and diverse communities there is huge database emanating from various programs being implemented by government across the agri value chains beginning from soils hydrology land holding patterns cropping systems supply chains etc etc 
For example, the Soil Health Card program distributed the health status of farm holdings and prescriptions for balanced use of fertilizers to over 110 million farmers in two biennial cycles each, which is no mean achievement. The income support program of PM Kisan was built up and direct transfer of funds to the farmer bank, farmer's bank accounts enabled within a few months starting in December 2013, 2018, now reaching over 101 million authenticated beneficiaries. The low interest farm credit cards are available to 12 million farmers. Hence, big data analytics and AI are being used through a cross-disciplinary approach and relying majorly on agri-tech startups for improved understanding of issues and policy and programmatic interventions for a more robust, sustainable, climate-resilient agri-practices. Our major focus in view of the challenges of climate change, among others, is to increase area coverage by targeting the rice fallow, development, release, and distribution of improved uh, varieties, which includes uh, biofortified, climate resilient, and processable ones, increase water use efficiency in agriculture, integrated nutrient management, and integrated pest management, focusing more on biofertilizers, biopesticides, and biocontrols. Skilling of local youth in farm and allied activities under the Skill India mission is enhancing their employability, also reducing the rural urban migration, redefining the mandate of agriculture so as to expand its horizon beyond the current predominant deliverables that is food and nutrition security. Agriculture is also being mandated to generate resources as raw materials for to feed and support industrial enterprises, chemicals, biofuels, construction, fiber, food, medicinal, plants, etc. Improve rural infrastructure to cater to the needs of a robust supply chain to help industry become self-reliant on domestic feedstock. Attaining self-sufficiency in oil seeds and edible oils is a major vision for the sector through a multi-pronged strategy. And here there could, there could be strong links uh, with Canada. Setting up a cold chain infra for supply chains. Establishing backward and forward linkage projects. Ag Agro-food processing clusters mega food parks, as well as supporting micro food processing enterprises are some of the key areas of the Ministry of Food Processing Industry. I uh, hope that the experts, researchers, companies and entrepreneurs from the two countries will have valuable discussions in the coming two days, leading to exchange of information and best practices to further the cause of sustainable farming, climate resilient agriculture, improving productivity and trade and investment opportunities to increase farm, farmers' income and the livelihood in the two countries. Thank you and Jai Hind. Thank you, Dr. Bhargav. Uh, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we conclude the formal addresses and now proceed with the interaction rounds with the industry specialists. Our first round is on Ag Tech Solutions. The session moderator is Mr. Vasant Bennett, Managing Partner at Emergent Gateway and also India Director for Burgo Industries. Mr. Bennett, over to you for taking this forward and all the best for an engaging interaction with fabulous panelists. Uh, you're on mute, uh, Vasan. Just a minute. I think, uh, please unmute uh, Achyut. Please unmute all the panelists. It's not on mute, but we can hear it. Yeah. I think we'll need to rush and run a... Uh, yeah, Vasan, try again. No, not yet. Can you please see? Uh, Sikandar, why don't you, uh, Mr. Gill, why don't you please try and see? We'll test everyone's audios quickly, all the panelists. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm already on. Yeah, you're on, yes. Uh, Hi, Larry here. Yeah. Fine. Like Mr. Tiagi? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Mr. Purushottam? Mr. Purushottam? Yes. Mr. Purushottam? Uh, we had Mr. Patam on just now. Yeah, he's also there. He's from yes, uh, just waiting for him to say. 
to test this audio vasant you want to try again am mr pushottam is here larry could you just say something and mr pushottam could you say something so that we can just check the audio good evening uh, can you hear me please yeah 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 yes mr pushottam larry would you be able to say sure can you hear me uh, yes larry okay, okay so vasant can we get back to you yes we can perfect vasant yes uh thank you nadira uh, first i want to thank uh, itpc can, can you still hear me pretty well yes mm -hmm. yeah all of the speakers kindly mute yourself thank you yeah uh, i i first want to thank uh, icbc for putting this together uh, for many of us uh, i'm still getting an echo is anyone else hearing that no it's fine kasan please go ahead yeah Uh, so, so some of us have been looking forward to uh, this ag agri tech conference for a very, very long time, uh, and it was a long time coming. I'm glad that the Ministry of External Affairs, CII, and especially ICBC uh, came together to uh, put up this uh, seminar. Uh, we want to uh, have this session be interactive. Uh, and so if time permits we i know we are behind schedule but if time permits we want to take a few questions uh, to the panelists so please post your questions uh, in the chat box uh, a quick introduction i'm on this panel because of my re recent stint with a company called burgo industries out of saskatchewan uh, it's nice that uh, saskatchewan was mentioned by Uh, high commissioner bisaria and there are quite a few panelists uh, from saskatchewan as well uh, and that's appropriate because we are talking about agriculture and agricultural equipment um, however now i'm uh, i'm actually an it and a business professional uh, but chose to switch directions and get into uh, agricultural equipment Uh, and i'm looking at, through my company called emergent gateway we are looking at being a value added dealer for a canadian company uh, agricultural equipment company that wants to uh, get into india uh, ag tech is a broad area uh, as you know uh, and uh, we can cover it from various angles uh, and so uh, i decided to uh kind of steer the path uh, based on the panelists themselves and so i'll uh, do a quick introduction of uh, the panelists i'll make it very brief because we want to hear from the panelists rather than hearing me introduce the panelists uh, the first is uh, mr mark uh, king uh, he is from uh, the government of uh, uh, new uh, excuse me Uh, from the government of new brunswick uh, and uh, uh, he he is a farmer and he is an agrologist so it's great to have a farmer and an agrologist uh, on the panel uh, we next have uh, dr sikandar gill uh, from lumex instruments uh, lumex does uh, various sensing and diagnostic equipment uh, lab based and in the field and we look forward to uh, hearing from him Uh, we have mr rajneesh tyagi fr from proveta nutrition also from uh, saskatchewan uh, specifically saskatoon um, proveta nutrition does many things but uh, primarily feed and nutrition for the livestock industry uh, and we have uh, larry doherty uh, from massitech a very interesting technology i didn't even know know that that technology existed until i uh, looked up the website uh, and finally mr ravindran burshotman from danfoss uh, the danish company that uh, does various technologies for various applications like compressors electronic controls and uh, so on so to put uh, the the way i decided to structure uh this uh, session is 
to divide it up into three components. The first is sensing and diagnostics, uh, and we have a couple of companies in that space. Uh, and then I wanted to jump to solutions and execution, the other end of the spectrum. And then uh, all of us can jump in and talk about the middle, uh, which is the processing and diagnostics, uh, which we've heard a lot about, right? Uh, the data analytics, the big data, the cloud computing, uh, the artificial intelligence or machine learning and so on. Uh, so our panel can jump in uh, on that uh, towards uh, in the second uh, round. So starting with sensing and diagnostics, I'd first like to call upon uh, Sikander at Lumex Instruments, please. Um, th thank you, Vasan. Um, okay, in uh, today's uh, panelist discussion, my uh, topic which I'm addressing is microchip-based real-time PCR technology in the service of agriculture. So Lumex Instruments Canada actually manufactures uh, analytical instruments. There are six of them, and one of them is uh, a mercury analyzer, which is a real-time analyzer of mercury in the field and in the laboratory. And another one is atomic spectrophotometer for nutrition, uh, uh, atomic like uh, nutrition analysis of soils and other things, whatever is possible. And then there's FTIR spectrophotometer, which is for moisture uh, uh, determiner uh, in the food grains which are stored or, or before storing or after storing or during storing. And then fluorometer, that's for environmental monitoring. So the major uh, instrument which I'm focusing today is microchip based real time pcr analyzer so this is basically a very small instrument which goes to the field uh, is field deployable and it works with a microchip uh, let me show you the microchip here so is this microchip which has a metal part uh, the shining part and around that is uh, the plastic uh, adapter and so in the metal part there are 30 micro wells and each micro well runs a real time PCR reaction, which is state of the art. Real time PCR is state of the art technology. But uh, uh, this system that offers many advantages over the existing um, uh, technology. Uh, one is that it cost effective because it's very miniaturized reaction volume is about 16 times lesser reagent con consumer than the state of the art real time PCR technology. So it's very rapid. It's 12 degrees Celsius per sec because the system has to go cycling, uh, high temperature, low temperature, high temperature. So those kind of cycles, they are necessary for the biology to take place. Uh, so uh, the system that uh, covers the entire 45 cycle determination in 20 minutes versus 60 to 90 minutes, which are taken by the state of the art technology, which I'm uh, comparing with. And uh, Third benefit which it offers is the ready to run microchips because the reagents, they are already lyophilized in the microchip. So the technician has to just take it out and then put the sample into describe the sample and run the uh, run the assay. So it will give you the uh, analysis. Then um, the fourth uh, benefit is, as I said earlier, also the portable device is small instrument that's battery operatable and it can be operated by semi-skilled technician. So because of those uh, benefits uh, it offers, uh, it's applicable to diverse applications, for example, in research and development, routine testing or screening uh, of pathogens in plants or animals, or resistance markers in the plants and genetically modified organisms uh, or, genet uh, or GMO uh, sequences in the foods, which are because there are many foods which are being genetically modified and uh, sold in the market. And uh, so from that angle, this technology is applicable to diverse crops, tubers, seeds, propagating materials, livestock, animals, and stuff like that. And um, uh, this, uh, uh, the microchips, which I said, are ready to use, uh, means they have the dried reagents uh, put uh, together into it. So we are offering, say, grape wine pathogen detection uh, microchip and potato pathogen uh, 
cannabis fungus uh, pathogen botrytis cinerea uh, in a way and uh, gmo detection in maize and some other uh, crops uh, then uh, cashmere uh, which is pashmina adulteration detection because uh, uh, Kashmir industry, uh, especially in India, China and other countries is uh, suffering from adulteration of uh, the Kashmir wool with other uh, wool, uh, uh, other wool like sheep and other things, uh, other animals. So uh, this technology that can help you uh, address to detect how much percentage of uh, adulteration of the other fiber is there in it. Then uh, African swine fever virus detection, which is very serious disease in, uh, among the swine. Then cattle pathogen detection, the livestock that has many pathogens. So those pathogens, they are detected just from the single or sample. It will give you the whole spectrum of uh, pathogens which are uh, which can infect the cattle. Then food pathogen. So again, it's a panel of uh, eleven pathogens which can be found in the in food. So the food sample they can be detected from there. And uh, so based on the uh, novelty this technology offers in terms of uh, state of the art uh, high speed cycling process and the sensitivity and the uh, and the user friendliness uh, this technology offers and the cost effectiveness uh, that it makes the test very cheap very very economical for a farmer uh, to get it tested and also in the field uh, so uh, the, this technology that won um, uh, silver medal uh, in the pitcon 2019 grand challenge uh, uh, competition uh, so uh, with this uh, uh, information, so I will look forward to uh, discuss any question uh, from the audience. So thank you very much for now. Yeah, yeah, thank you, uh, Sikandar. That was excellent. Uh, before we go to Massitech, I'd like to loop back to uh, Mr. Mark King uh, to give us uh, the policy and uh, the opportunity perspective in AgTech, we heard quite a lot about these uh, opportunities from uh, the various uh, players, uh, from the various speakers in the inaugural session, uh, but we'd love to get uh, Mark's perspective as well. Uh, Mark, uh, are you uh, on, on the call? Yes, I'm here, do you hear me? Yes, perfectly well, go ahead. Thank you, Asant. Um, as a policymaker, I guess uh, the whole pandemic has created awareness when it comes to renewed interest on, on the food production and overall food security. So the threats of uh, closed borders, um, essential food supplies, um, input uh, for crop production, as well as seasonal workforce was jeopardized with the pandemic. So a renewed focus on on being able to grow enough food for, for ourselves. And we are in New Brunswick, a small province of 750,000 people, but uh, we are known to, to punch greater than our, our, our weight. Um, we have over 40 commodities that we grow on 2,250 farms. Uh, we've got over 125 processing plants. Uh, we are one of the largest provinces or uh, ha has the highest rate of processing by processing over 80% of our, ag our agricultural products uh, here in the province into value added products. So as uh, as from the production side to the processing side, very important when it comes to agri-technology and making sure that we improve our productivity, that we can uh, we can use these technologies so that we can have a safer food product, more consistent food product, and that uh, our farmers are able to be competitive on a global scale as well. We export 80% of our products to the United States, but we also export to the over 35 other countries when it comes to seafood and agri-food and we are we have a long rich history when it comes to those sectors our um, indoor growing for new brunswick is is very important because we only produce about seven percent of our fruits and vegetables that we consume here in new brunswick so um that's that's renewed our interest in agri-tech solutions so that we can be more productive and that we can um, focus on providing our own population as well as other populations with uh, food products year round, whether they'd be fresh produce or they'd be uh, on the processing side. Uh, 
So on a pr productivity perspective, agri-tech solutions are even more important uh, to incorporate in our um, farming practices in order to make better decisions and to make better use of our available resources, especially when we are under threat, whether it be a pandemic or other reasons. Uh, we've got a robust uh, university and college uh, system in place that works in in collaboration with private sector to continue to work on developing new technologies and agri-tech solutions. And you may hear some of the work from, from some of our panelists when it comes to New Brunswick uh, agri-tech companies that have um, been in the space of agriculture in the recent years. Mechanization is very prevalent in farming uh, for some, some of our larger industries, such as potatoes, dairy, maple syrup production, wild blueberries, but many of our smaller industries, such as vegetables and other small small fruit crops, are very labor in intensive, and agri-tech solutions are needed to keep these farm uh, operations competitive on the local scale and as well as on the global scale. Our processing industry has had significant challenges with productivity and lack of technical, techno, technological solutions, such as AI and other data-driven solutions are needed to alleviate the ongoing labor force challenges our sectors are facing when it comes to the, to the processing industry. Whether it be seafood or agri-food, uh, we are seeing major challenges and that can be resolved with uh, advanced technologies. Some of our tech solution examples found in our sectors are precision agriculture technology, especially in our larger crops such as potatoes and cereal crops, robotic milking in our dairy farms, robust testing laboratory for milk quality and seed potato disease screening, a uh, strong R&D presence in industrial hemp genetics, working on producing consistent high quality CBDs and other cannabinoids, as well as state of the art storage facilities that provides excellent quality fresh potatoes and apples 12 months of the year. So these are all uh, ongoing uh, technologies that our farming community do, do use on an ongoing basis, but there is still need for uh, applied research and more research to be able to support that. In New Brunswick, we have uh, 2.5 million acres of arable soil, of which uh, we are only using a portion of that. Um, Basically, at this point, we would uh, be looking at 4.7% of our arable land is being farmed. So we've got uh, 340,000 hectares that's in production uh, right now. So we've uh, worked on um, an interactive mapping system to be able to support um, any uh, new entrant to farming that wants to locate in areas that are suitable for production. This uh, identifies soil structure, soil uh, capacity, as well as climate incorporates climate data uh, to be able to support decision-making when it comes to establishing a farm in New Brunswick, for example. I invite anybody to come to our GNB uh, um, website and see this interactive map and being able to support that. So government supports new and existing farmers through a variety of programs uh, mentioned earlier, our Canadian agricultural partnership uh, uh, initiatives. Uh, we definitely have uh, focused programming on innovation, technology and research to continue the growth in the sectors while remaining competitive on the global marketplace. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, as uh, many of the panelists before us uh, mentioned, uh, there's uh, a, a move from uh, trade in agriculture to agri-tech. Uh, and uh, the kinds of solutions that you talked about uh, are very appropriate uh, for that uh, future relationship between India and uh, Canada. Uh, next, uh, thank you. Uh, next, I'd uh, like to uh, go to uh, Larry at uh, Bassetech. Uh, very interesting technology, Larry. I'd love to hear more about it. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invitation to participate and uh, be able to talk uh, and say a few words about our product and how it improves uh, the agri industry. So the basic uh, premise and approach that we've taken with our product to help improve the industry is we've 
introduced a product that uh, by design is very simplistic to use, but the underlying technology behind it uh, has a lot of thought behind it. Essentially, we want something that could have the immediate impact uh, that anybody could pick up and use and immediately identify uh, where there was issues in the supply chain or the harvesting cycle. So what our system is composed of is we've developed a sensor. Uh, we have a mobile application that primarily uh, we use on Microsoft, Microsoft tablets for portability. And then we have a back end for reporting uh, where we upload this uh, sensor collection on uh, Microsoft Azure a web app. So essentially, I don't know if you can see the camera, we have the, uh, we have the sensor here. And uh, we have a number of cases that we can produce. We pour molds to produce, to replicate fruits, uh, potatoes, vegetables, any type like that. So to step through what it would look like is essentially if you're, um, whether it's in the processing or whether it's in the harvesting state, we manifest this product in three major categories. Uh, we have a crackless egg, uh, we have a smart spud, and then we have produce QC, uh, which again can be manifested by many casings. Uh, the product is used in different points, as I say, in the supply chain. And the biggest, uh, the biggest points are obviously to increase revenue. It's to reduce damage. It's to allow uh, an operator to pinpoint where they might be having issues with their equipment, uh, where they might be having issues with transportation of the product, right from uh, right from um, the harvesting, right to the uh, right to the supermarket stage. Uh, so, and the benefit is because it's a real time system. Uh, this can be this product can be run through any type of process on the potato side of it. We've run it in the field. It's been harvested like a real potato. It's allowed uh, users in that scenario to very quickly identify where they've had issues right down to uh, making adjustments and optimizations on the equipment in the field. Uh, the same thing on the transportation. It's it's given uh, it's given users uh, areas where they can improve how the product is transported. They've made redesign changes in how it's uh, held in uh, in cargo and moved from uh, point A to point B. And then finally, in the major processing centers, it's also identified you know where they've had equipment issues and allows them very quickly to go in and send an engineering team in to make calibrations and to drive change immediate. So we, we've seen, uh, we have a lot of data from different clients where we've seen some massive improvements. Most recently, I was talking to a large Apple uh, processor in the United States, and they've gotten tremendous value from the product because essentially they've been flying blind before, as well as the growers. And uh, that is the beauty of the product. It acts and behaves like the exact, whether it's an egg, uh, it's a, it's an apple or it's a potato. It can be integrated into uh, to go through every cycle, every life stage cycle that the actual product goes through, and give you immediate data on what's in, what's being experienced by the product. So it uh, the on the ground impact and immediate uh, identification of the root cause of problems is a real power behind the product. Great. Yep. Thank you, Larry. You're welcome. Yep. So from the uh, sensing and diagnostic area that we started out with, uh, I'd like to move to uh, the uh, other end of the spectrum, the solutions and the execution. Uh, and uh, to start off with, uh, I would like to have uh, Mr. Rajneesh uh, Tyagi uh, talk about uh, Proveta Nutrition and how uh, technology is applied to the feed and the nutrient space. Go ahead, Raj. Uh, thanks, Vasant, and good morning, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, Provita Nutrition is one of the fastest growing company into Western Canada in terms of like specialty feed products. And uh, our focus is into the agri agriculture innovation and biotechnology. So we started this company like in 2014 uh, with almost like uh, 20 people on board and all. Now we have 50 uh, employees and we got five locations, including our in-house R&D center. So the technology we uh, developed actually, we just want to integrate uh, the local grown crops, which is uh, plant proteins into how we can basically uh, utilize them bad, uh, better into the livestock industry, livestock feed. So the technology we have is called uh, Pro Plus, and Pro Plus is basically improved and uh, balanced protein with higher digestibility. 
So how we uh, produce ProPlus? ProPlus is uh, we can utilize any cereal or uh, legume crop here. And we have to basically involve uh, two different process into this. So first step is enzymatic hydrolysis uh, to break down most of the NSPs into the digestible carbohydrates or digestible sugars. And then we take them forward and we go to a two stage fermentation, which involve anaerobic and aerobic fermentation. And is it definitely 60, 70 hours time cycle uh, where we are able to uh, convert uh, all these proteins into the oligopeptides. And these oligopeptides are definitely having a higher digestibility uh, and we can go uh, into the protein isolation and, and, and we can produce those uh, protein concentrates and protein isolates into the oligopeptide form. So what we're doing here uh, when we doing all this, so we have a lot of NSPs into all these crops, uh, which is uh, non-starch polysaccharides and ANF, and we convert them into the high value nutrients. Uh, which includes uh, some antioxidants. Uh, it also includes uh, a type of like organic acids, which is lactic acid, acetic acid, and it also produces a lot of energy uh, through organic uh, glycerol. So this ProPlus technology, uh, where we produce this ProPlus utilizing local crops is wonderful, is, is expanding, and, and we're doing very well uh, with this kind of technology, uh, where we are basically uh, more focused into protein digestibility, NSP utilization, and removing all kind of ANF. So this specialty feed products where, where we work on ProPlus definitely is, is, is an area to go, where your protein intake is less, and digestibility is high, and, and performance is better. Now, not only ProPlus, we have other technology uh, which we have been working and is, is going through, uh, which call it uh, GoldAs. GoldAs is an antibiotic replacement or limiting the use of antibiotics into the livestock industry into Western Canada. And we have been very successful. We have been working with uh, ruminants. We have been working with uh, different kind of like monogastic species. And we have been very successful because this uh, technology we have been working on this antibiotic replacements is, is combination of different kind of uh, polyphenolic compounds. And, and it also has some sort of oleoregins, which is all uh, plant based extracts. So uh, definitely uh, we have been working with companies in India and we have working, working with companies into Western Canada and, and we have almost like good client base where this gold edge is very successful. Other area we are working on, uh, which is basically toxin binding and immunomodulators. So uh, we have uh, products where they can bind the mycotoxins. If you see like into the crops where they're coming in and if they have any kind of like dawn or vomitat toxins, we can utilize our technology where we're fermenting and we're taking all these like different kind of yeast beta glucan and, and MOS and they can bind these toxins. So we have uh, very, very efficient uh, toxin binders in place. So as a whole, when we look at Provita, is, is one of the most innovative company into the especially the feed products. And all these technology, what we're developing here, and we have in-house R&D center with our team of scientists and all, definitely we, we have focused more to like advance into India and, and how we can work with a livestock feed industry or aquaculture industry, or even with the plant proteins. Because uh, the, the level of all kinds of crops we have been utilized, we have been working on soybean, which is a major crop in India. We have been working on canola, which is having a equivalent crop like rapeseed. And, and we have been working on all kinds of legumes, including, including red, lent red lentils, yellow peas, uh, green peas, all those kinds of things. So this definitely is giving us a better platform to work with all these kind of specialty feed products and, and to take it forward from uh, there. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Raj. Yeah, if yeah. Any, anyone yeah. would like to ask any questions about our technologies, our products, or about Provita, definitely most welcome. Yeah, thank you, Raj. That was excellent. I'd uh, next like to move on to uh, Dan Foss. Uh, Mr. Ravi Chandran uh, Purushottaman, um, and uh, 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 Danfoss makes uh, components for various uh, applications, high technology components, uh, and uh, uh, looking forward to get his perspective. Go ahead, uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Ravi. Thank you, Mr. Vasan. Can you hear me, please? Perfectly well, yes. Okay, so uh, thanks for uh, this opportunity. And, uh, you know, just to give a little bit of context, uh, I'm actually representing CII Food and Agriculture Center of Excellence. And, uh, you know, um, the reason that I'm here on this platform is to give a holistic overview of uh, what is happening in the agri space in India, what are the kind of activities that we are involved in, and where do, you, where, do, where do we think that the Canadian companies can come in and add significant value to us? 
so uh, contextually you know um, in in phase uh, we are basically looking at working in uh, clusters so we take a particular commodity and we look at uh, right from uh, you know three different spectrum the pre harvest side the post harvest side and the market connectivity side as well so we look at the holistic ecosystem of a particular crop and in phase we have worked uh, quite a bit on uh, different uh, horticulture crops uh, we are also working now on fisheries and dairy but let me pick a few examples uh, so you can understand the connect between what what technology can be a big disruptor as far as agri space is concerned uh, we worked on apples uh, in himachal uh, mangoes in andhra pradesh and bananas in tamil nadu and let me pick an example of, of banana we have been working on banana for the last 10 years uh, in in india and uh, we have gone into a cluster and looked at uh, specifically for bananas um, how does uh, the pre harvest practices uh, are operating uh, the post harvest management of the fruit is being handled and then the last is around how do we brand bananas and position bananas actually when you look at these three spaces you know about 8 to 10 years back uh, we never had uh, technology intervention into this uh, space but over the last 5 years we have seen quite a number of startups in india now uh, starting to prevail upon these spaces i will just kind of flag out some technologies that we are currently using in this space as bananas to give you a perspective of uh, you know what can be potentially available for canadian companies i mean if you take the pre harvest site Uh, we now have companies providing satellite imaging remote sensing uh, artificial intelligence uh, on how to prepare the soil and how to actually bring insightful interventions to the farmers and and let us remember that farmers are not really having the intellectual capability to respond to information so using insight driven algorithms you know we need to actually provide actions to farmers we need to nudge farmers actually so technologies around satellite imaging remote sensing ai uh, iot all of this actually has been deployed uh, you know in this space as well uh, drones are also being uh, quietly uh, you know uh, uh, leveraged across for data collection monitoring analysis of the farm uh, recommending farmers and businesses about the pest attacks that might come in uh, drones are also being used to measure the impact of natural calamity i mean we have a uh, we have actually been able to predict floods in the farms because you know the intensity of rain increases in a shorter duration of time and actually there's a lot of uh, insights that are generated out of the drones and you know making them as nudge information to farmers is a very uh, great opportunity and a business as well uh, robotics is another example i can tell you uh, you know uh, several years back uh, when we went into the uh, banana farms we never had rope conveying today we can actually uh, convey the uh, banana fruit on a rope and use robotics to cut them and you know make life easy for you know the post harvest management of this so that the fruit has less uh, uh, you know less impact by cutting uh, you know through the manual processes and we could actually reduce the wastage as well so the advanced technologies here actually can also bring in significant benefits to the farmers um, when it comes to post harvest management i think this is an area where uh, barcoding becomes very important uh, because today bananas which are produced uh, you know consumers are looking at where it is produced how is it harvested where it is ripened so there's a lot of barcoding that is needed and i think along with barcoding we have also seen that you know using ai we can actually get much more mapping about the uh, you know the the self life of the banana and take decisive actions for the farmer so that he can price the bananas rightly and you know take full advantage of uh, you know not letting go the value that he has created from uh, the ripening process uh, then of course you know um, uh, as, as uh, many of the speakers have spoken about the agri market connectivities i mean you know many a times uh, we are not able to get good bananas from uh, let's say tamil nadu reach delhi or you know great bananas from maharashtra reach on the west coast so i think there's a lot that technology can bring in you know multimodal connectivity using efficient transport systems there's a lot of technology aspects is also you know being deployed here uh, so i think over a period of last 5 6 years we have seen that you know startups are growing uh, i think this is a great area where canadian companies can work together with the indian uh, agri space 
uh, where face can provide a good platform for for the companies and we can actually be part of uh, you know a large ecosystem because you know agriculture is such a complex subject uh, you know india is a continent of 30 countries and uh, clusters becomes very important and dealing with these clusters means you also need to win the loyalty of the farmers the trust of the farmers and engaging with universities is very important because you know as industry when we go some we, you know when we take technology to farmers I think it's difficult to make them adapt to the technologies. Whereas if you go via the universities, deploying the technology becomes, uh, you know, very useful. So contextually, you know, just to sum up, uh, innovation and new technologies uh, being developed mostly have, uh, you know, helped uh, business models uh, in India evolve over time. I can't say that, you know, we have reached a very mature stage, but clearly, you know, uh, technology has become a resource liberating force. Lastly, before I conclude, I just want to make one caution here. You know, technology has to be also uh, delivered in a form where farmers in India can afford it. So we need to democratize technology and we need to use business models to also deliver in a way, actually. So this is another space where I think Canada is very good at it. So we might have to look at how we can use uh, democratization of technology, business model innovation, you know, service as a business in many of the equipments that you want to offer, because, you know, I, farmers are not going to put in a lot of capex here. So this innovation of finance, fintech along with technology space, I think this uh, fusion or, you know, the potential evolution of combining different technologies, I think India is a great battleground for many companies. And I think from a startup ecosystem, I have been seeing this space for the last 10 years now. We have an exciting opportunity now, and most of the impacts that technology impacts that are being created in farm are largely coming from startup companies. So I think it's a very exciting space, and, and I truly believe that there's great opportunities for Canadian companies and the Indian companies uh, to work together. And I think in this space, uh, you know, we would be willing to support any, um, any company that wants uh, hand-holding and we have several clusters intervention that is going on. So I think phase is the right point of contact for the Canadian companies where they can come in and, you know, we can handhold them and put them onto some, uh, you know, seamless process so that they, they can capture the full value that is available. I will stop here and, you know, maybe look for some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, that was an excellent uh, uh, wrap up. Uh, can you still hear me pretty well? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I was told that uh, I need to wrap up uh, really quick, uh, actually uh, in a few minutes. Uh, and so I won't be able to go through that second loop uh, that I was hoping to do. Uh, but uh, to Ravi Chandran's point on uh, the applicability to the Indian farmer and the democratization of the technology, uh, do any of the other panelists want to do a 30 second to one minute comment before we wrap up? Um, yeah, so as Ravi Chandran said, the, the technology that should be affordable to farmers. So from that angle, uh, so this technology is highly affordable because it's 60 times cheaper than the other uh, real time systems which are available in the in the market and uh, especially during the pandemic situation we are going around so supply bottlenecks are there and uh, so since this uh, uh, supply of this thing that can go 16 times more uh, samples it can do so from that angle uh, sure. I, I agree with the uh, uh, Chandran. thank you anyone else Okay, uh, with that, uh, I want to thank all of the panelists. Uh, it was an excellent uh, session. Uh, thank you, uh, Ravi Chandran, for doing an excellent job putting it all together uh, with, the, with the whole uh, cluster concept. And uh, uh, we, we uh, Nadira, are you there or sh should I keep yes. going with the next? Go ahead, yeah, Nadira. Yeah. Yeah, Vasanta. Just I just wanted to know whether I know Mark and Mike are here. But if you can, uh, Everyone is Mike or uh, Mark, in case you'd like to. How can we continue with the second session? Yes. So I think everyone is uh, present for the next session as well. Uh, so so uh, we'll we'll uh, roll right into that.
So, so let me start uh, directly with introducing all the panelists. Nadira, can you mute yourself? Otherwise, the echo is coming. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Yeah. So, so the next panel discussion is on uh, sustainable farming, uh, and we have an amazing uh, lineup of panelists. I want to thank uh, ICBC and CII for putting together uh, a quality uh, panel. Um, I can spend the entire 45 minutes talking about each of the panelists, but uh, that's not why all of the participants are here. So I'll give uh, a very brief introduction of each of the panelists and we can uh, jump right into uh, the actual uh, presentations from the panelists. Uh, I first want to introduce uh, Padma Shri, Dr. Ashok Gulati. Uh, this is the first time I've met a Padma Shri, sir, so uh, it's a great honor uh, to meet with you. Hopefully, we can meet uh, 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 in person at some point in the future. Uh, Dr. Ashok Gulati is the Infosys Chair Professor of Agriculture at ICRIER, uh, a think tank focused on economic policy, and I'm really looking forward to his perspective from an econ economic and a policy uh, perspective. Uh, and we'll start uh, with that in just a little bit. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Mike Webb uh, from Nutrien, uh, another Saskatoon, Saskatchewan-based company. So uh, welcome, Mike. Uh, Nutrien uh, is a world leader, uh, not surprisingly in potash, coming from Saskatchewan, uh, but also in uh, other uh, fertilizers as well. Uh, and uh, uh, what stood out about uh, Mike's background is his uh, 20 years in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, so, in addition to talking about uh, the inputs, uh, fertilizers, uh, he can also uh, talk about how this applies, uh, not only in India, uh, but in other emerging markets as well. Uh, next, uh, we are really glad to have uh, Godridge Agrovet uh, on the panel, a very diversified agribusiness uh, that uh, went public a few years ago. And uh, Pramod uh, can offer all kinds of perspectives because of how uh, diversified uh, Godridge Agrovet is. Uh, but I've requested him to also focus uh, on uh, the inputs. Uh, and how sustainability uh, uh, goes into it. Uh, next is uh, uh, Mr. Vikas Mittal from uh, McCain Foods. Uh, McCain is, uh, uh, I mentioned in the previous session uh, that uh, I was part of Burgo and I was working on the India, in, India entry strategy uh, for Burgo and for the organic path, we looked at how McCain did it. Uh, McCain hired an agronomist right off the bat, and uh, I look forward to the farmer outreach uh, that McCain did, uh, which is a critical part of uh, sustainable farming, right? Uh, connecting, that, uh, connecting to the farmers and uh, winning the trust of the farmer that McCain has done very painstakingly uh, over a period of time. Uh, and finally, uh, Mr. Mark uh, McLoon uh, from the Smart Energy Company, uh, which is uh, uh, which developed the first solar farm in New Brunswick. Another uh, panelist from New Brunswick, and uh, I've requested that he cover sustainable uh, sustainable farming uh, using uh, green uh, agriculture. To introduce the topic, uh, India, as many of the uh, previous speakers have talked about, India is an agricultural powerhouse, right? Whether you look at wheat, rice, tea, milk, uh, or the amount of arable land, uh, India is at or near the top 
uh, in terms of worldwide production. Uh, and a lot uh, of that was because of the green revolution uh, that all of us have heard about in the 60s and the 70s. But my perspective, and uh, this is from uh, the research that uh, we've done, is that uh, India is uh, an agricultural powerhouse uh, creaking under the weight of structural challenges, an explosion in demand, and unsustainable farming practices. And so with the recent reforms that many of the panelists referred to, we are making a beginning in the structural uh, challenges, the structural challenges that India faced. And we've heard enough about it, so I won't go into it in more detail. Uh, the increase in demand is uh, just uh, a reality for India. Uh, but I'm excited about covering the third area, uh, which is sustainable farming practices. Uh, and so um, without uh, uh, any further delay, I'd like to call upon uh, Dr. Ashok uh, Gulati uh, to give us an economic and a policy perspective. Thank you, Mr. Vasant. Uh, a pleasure to be a part of this distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I'm going to uh, touch upon uh, some of the key issues related to policy and how sustainability is being impacted. We all know that by 2027, India is going to be the most populous country on this planet. And even after COVID, you know, our per capita income is likely to be growing at 5%, 6% per annum. So you have a combination of rising population and increasing per capita incomes. And the first major pressure is going to be on the demand. And the demand, not just for basic staples, uh, which now more or less we have achieved the so-called food security, we have to move to a bigger challenge of nutritional security. You know, our children below five are, you know, 35 to 40 percent range of underweight children and uh, stunted children. So the nutritional challenge up to 2030 is one of the biggest challenges that India is going to face on food front. But if you have to produce more and produce more nutritious food, how sustainable you can be. And that is the next challenge because water table is depleting in the country uh, like anything, uh, especially in the seat of green revolution in Punjab, Haryana belt. Uh, you know, 80% of the blocks in Punjab today are uh, red, literally. That means the depletion is much faster than uh, recharge. And that is what brings me to the issue of policies. And if you have a policy of free power, water is not being priced, power is not being priced, it's not being regulated properly, then you start growing those crops which are highly water intensive in those regions which are not suitable for it. And Punjab is a classic example. Today we have 3 million hectares plus under paddy cultivation, which requires about 25 irrigations in Punjab. That was not the crop of Punjab. Water table in central Punjab is going down by 0.7 meters a year. That is the rate of depletion. Now, you have on top of that a procurement system by the government, which is open-ended. So whatever they grow, they will they can sell it to the government at a fixed price. So no market risk in that. Power is free. On top of that fertilizer, particularly urea, you have a 75% subsidy on urea literally. We have the cheapest urea pricing perhaps in the world, $75 a ton for urea. You know, the international price would be 200 plus 50. Now, what happens is they throw so much of urea, 75% of urea is not absorbed by the plants. Either it goes underground into the water table, 
leaches into that, increasing the nitrate content in the water, polluting, making it non potable, or it goes to the environment. And then when you are growing paddy, you know, through a ponding, you're literally flooding the field, you are creating a lot of methane, the so greenhouse gas emissions. So the issue of sustainable agriculture, increasing productivity with sustainability, I think we have yet to learn. The earlier the pressure was increased production, no matter at what cost, and that phase is over, I think we have to gradually learn, uh, but nobody can touch the pricing of power. It's a, it's a political hot potato. <laughs> nobody wants. So how technology can overcome this type of a problem? And for the last eight, 10 years, one of the companies in India, Jan Irrigation, for example, or uh, even, uh, uh, you know, uh, Aneta Fim of Israel, they had been doing experiments of drip irrigation in rice cultivation. It was literally not heard of. Now, everybody knows flooding the field, but this is a drip irrigation. You can easily save 50 to 60% of water and increase productivity. If you follow fertigation, so you can have a nutrient use efficiency of almost 90% compared to just throwing, spreading, uh, urea in the field so the technology you are subsidizing urea granule but you are not subsidizing the soluble fertilizer which can be put through the drip so it's an anomaly in a policy framework this encourages a very wasteful and very unsustainable farming practice rather than uh, increasing productivity with more precision and uh, more sustainability. Same thing, one minute more on the nutrition I want to emphasize because that's what I feel. Water and nutrition, these are the two biggest challenges in the next 10 years that Indian agriculture will face. And on the nutrition front, you know, the normal process to have more nutritious diets is through more protein diets, but they are expensive and the masses may not be able to afford that much, uh, milk or rice or meat and uh, so on and so forth. Can we fortify, biofortify the basic staples? Our soils are deficient in zinc. That has made our wheat and rice deficient in zinc, leading to stunting of children. Now, can the technologies bring in zinc-rich rice, zinc-rich wheat, uh, more antioxidants in wheat. Technologies are there. Harvest Plus has come up with the iron-rich pearl millet. And you know the anemia in this country and the deficiency of iron, uh, especially amongst women. So I think those technologies which are affordable to the masses to improve nutrition and those technologies which are affordable to the farmers to save on water and get the best crop, more crop per drop of water, as they say. If we can do that, and my take on this entire thing is technologies are there, but the policy environment is not conducive for uh, its adoption at a large scale. And that is a struggle that uh, we as Indians uh, have to go through if there are some illuminating examples from Canada, uh, either of technologies or of uh, uh, policies, uh, the latest being, uh, you know, in Delhi right now, uh, the stubble burning and the entire uh, choking environment, uh, air quality going down every day. Uh, if there are some cheaper technologies to take care of stubble burning or uh, in case of paddy or depleting water table and making food more nutritious. We would love to hear from the uh, Canadians on that. Thank you very much for this uh, first round. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ashok Gulati. Fascinating perspective. Uh, yeah, so for, for example, with uh, fertilizers, uh, Burgo, which does seeding equipment, places a precise amount of fertilizer 
at a precise distance from the seed to maximize absorption. Uh, and uh, that is unheard of in India because we broadcast the fertilizer rather than uh, place the fertilizer appropriately. Uh, great perspective, and uh, I wish we had more time because we, uh, I, I'd like to follow up on uh, many of the points that you've made, but uh, we'll move on. Um, so, so just rolling in with uh, the fertilizer perspective, uh, Mike, uh, you're in the fertilizer space, uh, and you know uh, India and other emerging markets. Uh, what is your perspective on uh, on what you offer and its applicability in the uh, Indian scenario as laid out by uh, Dr. Gulati? Mike, are you there? Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Um, I think I have to I have to unmute two different things to uh, to speak. Uh, but it, it's a real pleasure to be able to to uh, talk with you all today. And um, I, I lived in India for a year, and I and I am very 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 fond of uh, the great country. And um, it's nice to back in, in making this connection. It's been a while since I've been uh, involved in. In, uh, directly in affairs related to India. So it's nice to speak to you all today, and I hope I have something to say that's of, of interest. Um, first of all, let me explain um, what, it, what Nutrien does. Um, yes, Nutrien is the world's largest fertilizer manufacturer. We're the world's largest potash manufacturer. We're the third, uh, world's third largest nitrogen producer and the world's fourth largest uh, phosphate producer. But that's only one side of our business. The other side of our business is our retail organization where we are the world's largest agricultural retailer. And that involves a number of different things. Um, and what I'd really like to focus on is the role of precision agriculture um, in our business today. And this is something that has gone from basically nothing uh, to something quite significant over the last few years. And it's hosted by, or, or it's hosted by Nutrien's digital platform, which is only 18 months old. And why that is important is, is that as we, as an organization, and why that's important from a sustainability perspective is as Nutrien uh, grows in Brazil, we've added 1,000 employees uh, over the last six months in Brazil, we need to be very, very mindful of, of the risks that we take on as an organization. And one of them is, when you're involved in agriculture and you're involved in Brazil, the protection of the Amazonian rainforest is a very, very, very big deal. And so while one side of our business, the manufacturing side of the business would be very happy to um, uh, sell as much fertilizer as possible, as an organization, that's just not the way that it, it, can, it can work and we have to strike a balance. And so how we've positioned ourselves in Brazil is one where we can maximize the arable land today um, to allow Brazil to, and its agriculture industry, to grow as it needs to grow and without having to cut down more rainforest. And the difference, as you know, in particularly in the soil conditions in Brazil, between fertilized and unfertilized soil is, is immense in terms of the, not only the yield, uh, on a, a, but also the number of times um, a, a piece of land can be turned over. And in some cases, we're having three crops a year in Brazil, which is, which is quite amazing. Um, and so that our, our, our efforts have really been in terms of working closely with, with large farmers in Brazil, using our precision agriculture tools, using our soil sampling capability, and using our digital platform to make sure that the right nutrients are placed at the right time in the right place in the right amount, typically the four R's. And that has, that, and we've, we've seen the data, we've seen the yield data, we've seen what it, what it does for our farmer's profitability, and we're very pleased with that. And to be clear, you know, a, a smarter use of fertilizer, and in some cases less use of, use of fertilizer, is just fine from a nutrient perspective. It, from a business perspective, we as an organization do just fine under that uh, under that 
uh, scenario. So to, to Dr. Galati's earlier point about um, the, the use of fertilizer and how important it is used uh, safely and correctly, it is that is a remarkably important uh, thing to point out. And the way that technology has evolved is that we can do that today. You can literally, in North America, you can literally have a, a thumb drive, uh, plug it into a John Deere tractor, um, and what comes out of that uh, tractor is very, very specific to, to a farmer's uh, plot of land. And so, as an example, you know, a, we'll, we'll work with a farmer, we'll soil sample uh, his or her land, that will all go into a heat map. All that data will be downloaded into uh, our system. And depending on what kind of crop is being uh, 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 raised, what planted, what type of soil conditions, et cetera, et cetera, that data then gets put into a tractor and, and, and literally, you know, more phosphate goes here, less per, uh, potash goes here, and it is all uh, properly um, applied. In addition to that is that there is uh, the waterways, particularly in the United States, the waterways of the United States are protected in a lot of states and in, 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 uh, in Iowa is one of them. And so we're able to use GPS technology to ensure that nitrogen in particular is not applied uh, in areas that would run off into those US waterways. And so the, the technology is there today, it exists today and it can be used. And I think in terms of, again, going on to, to, to maybe building on Dr. Galati's earlier points about, about policy and policy frameworks is that, you know, is there an opportunity in India uh, to uh, balance maybe the subsidies that go to inputs uh, for things like digital adoption and precision agriculture adoption? Is that an opportunity? Because that would, uh, go a long way, not only to protect the environment, but also to ensure food security and, and food production. And, and that's something that, um, uh, you know, I think is worth talking about and thinking about. Also, one of the things, you know, it, it, I'll just throw this out there. One of the things that um, allows a, an easier adoption of our digital tools and technology is our larger farmers um, and, you know, where they can, the economics make sense. And so, you know, to what extent will there be consolidation of, of agriculture in India? Is that a good thing? Is it not a good thing? Because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of different things you need to think about um, in terms of moving in that direction or not. And then lastly, just the whole issue of infrastructure, of course, and to what extent um, can uh, can infrastructure be further developed to allow uh, the the efficient uh, transportation of of, um, of agricultural products uh, deep into the country or you know etc. So I guess maybe that's a um, a bit of a, a long winded way of of of, uh, of uh, explaining things, but I think that there's great opportunity. Um, in India for, for technology. We're seeing it work today in North America. We're seeing it evolve in Brazil. Um, and if it can, in, tho in th those parts of the world, it certainly can in India. And, and Nutrain is an organization that, um, you know, for our business to continue to grow and develop, um, you know, we need to be taking care of our environment and we get that. And nothing would make us happier for there to be absolute efficiency in the use of fertilizers um, and while protecting the government. And that may ultimately lead to less use of fertilizer, maybe, but that's just fine uh, because in other areas we all benefit. Great. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, great perspective. And hopefully we can loop back and get uh, Dr. Gulati's uh, response to uh, some of the questions that you raised. Uh, moving on, uh, I'd like to reach out to uh, Pramod uh, uh, Prasad uh, from uh, Godridge AgroVet. Uh, I suggested, uh, uh, Pramod, that you cover it from an input perspective, but uh, feel free to expand beyond that uh, as well. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, ICBC. And, uh... Dr. Gulati, sir, it's an honor to be on the same panel as you. Uh, uh, and uh, it's 
it's it's difficult to follow Mr. Dr. Gulati because he puts everything so succinctly. And uh, see, when you talk about sustainability, and especially in a country like ours, right? So what you're talking about is uh, broadly three elements. One is the nutritional security that uh, Dr. Gulati so rightly said. But in as you achieve that, how do you ensure a very remunerative situation to our farmers so that they are they, they participate willingly and their income there's a sustainable basis for their income? And how do you you know get in the environmental impact in place? Right. So these are the three elements of sustainability. If they fall into place, yes, you've got some sustainable uh, agriculture going. Now, uh, one of the things that falls in between all of this is yield improvement. And I think uh, water and irrigation has, has, has a very, very critical element. Uh, but in all of that, what does it say is that can we achieve the same with less or can we achieve more with less? Now, what it does is it makes everything cheaper, which makes everything affordable. So there's a widespread adoption and demand for that. Uh, at the same time, it reduces the cost for your farmers. So and hence their income and the profit kind of improve. And because you're using less from the environment, uh, the environment impact is also kind of, you know, kind of gets reduces. And that's where the input philosophy should always be in terms of, you know, how do you improve uh, the yield so that you can whatever it may be, it could be water, it could be fertilizer, it could be chemicals, it could be anything else. So how do you ensure that you consume less of it to provide the same or more as the demand kind of continues to grow? And here and where, you know, the three other elements that kind of fall in place. One is that, you know, in terms of you know, how do you bring technology? And technology uh, wasn't, is not necessarily, you know, in terms of the act tech or the AI. We, we, in India, it's still, we can still benefit a lot from even the genetic improvements in terms of the basic package of practices uh, that are there. A uh, widespread adoption of even those will give you a significant yield improvement. Uh, you take any sectors and we lag on these productivity by a, uh, you know, by a fact, you know, a lot of magnitude of two or three. Uh, take milk for an example, where uh, USA or in Israel does about 8,000 liters per lactation. Uh, we are at about 1,500 to 2,000, right? And we are the largest producer of milk in India. And, uh, you know, and even a 2x improvement in there, uh, you can see the amount of demand we can meet uh, in terms of in just simply doing that, right? Uh, so the technology adoption is across the spectrum. The other is in terms of how do we what is the kind of policy framework that can support this technology adoption? Uh, you know, uh, you know, Mike mentioned subsidies. We do about two like uh, crores of subsidies that are given by central the farmers, right? Uh, so that is one element of the policy framework. But can we make this a bit more market friendly? Can we can we bring in more competition? Can we bring in more ideas so that you know we are able to adopt them and you know that the whole concept of making it cheaper for the farmers to adopt, making it cheaper for the consumers to uh, consume more, uh, then I think that should be the, the policy framework should be guided around that and not necessarily in terms of providing the subsidies. Support, support is required because it's a transition and not an abrupt change. And finally, I think we need widespread consumer sensitization. Uh, while nutritional security is, 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 a, is a core aim, you also have an emerging consumer class that is more aware, uh, more to pay a bit of a premium uh, if it's more environmentally friendly. So the consumer sensitization needs to start parallelly uh, because that segment is only going to increase and they'll be able to pay a little bit more, which then can you know uh, help you uh, be a bit more sustainable, sustainable from an environment point of view and also be a bit more remunerative towards the farmer. Uh, just to give an example, we, we work a lot in the poultry sector. Uh, chicken is one of the cheapest protein sources that is available. Uh, the demand for it has significantly increased. The per capita consumption is almost tripled in the last couple of decades, uh, simply because it's been affordable, right? And this is a sector of the agriculture that's going at about six to seven percent for the last twenty years, uh, and it's been remunerative to the farmers. And one of the core areas why it's become adopted, it's become um, it's succeeded because of uh, the genetics improvement, which made that the you know you were able to get more meat from the bird uh, for less. Uh, the improvement in nutrition technology. Uh, some of the couple of companies on the panel kind of already alluded to that uh, in terms of you know how do you improve the protein availability etc from the plant based sources which the animals consume and then you know the humans can then uh, consume so that's been already under policy framework because very little government intervention there it's it's free for all from a from a point of view and anybody can compete anybody can provide a better a value proposition to the farmers and then participate in this ecosystem so so we already have some examples that kind of you know they're already in place 
so we can you know use that uh, and build on it from our own experiences and almost take help across these domains of you know technology policy and consumer sensitization uh, to make uh, you know uh, make it more sustainable yeah excellent uh, thank you uh, uh, pramod uh, hopefully we can loop back again uh, to you as well with some uh, follow up uh, the next i'm uh, really looking forward uh, to this uh, from uh, mr vittel uh, from mr uh, vikas mittel uh, from mckin um, because i suggested uh, farmer outreach because that's something that i've admired at uh, mckin uh, but uh, obviously uh, you can cover that and other topics that are related to uh, sustainable uh, farming yeah so thank you vasant and uh, thank you nadara and the icbc team for uh, having me here it's a pleasure and a privilege even more so because we have the session started by dr gulati and i would say you know he's just so so very well framed up the entire issues um so thank you sir for that and i'd like to just pick on uh, one theme which really is around that there is no other option but for productivity to run in parallel with sustainability i mean uh, just chasing one which is productivity uh, is not going to be adequate because soon we'll run out of stuff um and you know so what i can share is in some ways uh, the way we are looking at sustainability because in mccain i mean mccain is a global uh, frozen food company with you know the focus on potatoes and uh, globally we've just issued our first uh, sustainability report you know it's a privately held company but the company felt it uh, you know important enough that despite it being a private company to put the uh, sustainability commitments out in the public domain you know a big decision uh, for a, um, for a private company and really we've uh, looked at um, so i'll i'll link it to the india experience of farmers but really the point i wanted to make is that look sustainability is is very important and it cannot be negated at the expense of um, uh, productivity and there are really five pillars i think uh, which you know determine what sustainability is the first is a very known item carbon emissions you know we we are just now i think the entire industry and i'm very glad that i'm in a company that is publicly stating it now that carbon emissions per ton of our output produced with our respective farmers we have to commit to it as a company that we will work with our farmers to reduce the carbon emissions per ton of output now there are multiple inputs which go into it we've talked about fertilizer a big deal and it's a big issue in india because all the policy framework in india just pushes you towards blindly putting more fertilizer and it really doesn't help now i think the mccain experience what it teaches me i mean i have not been in mccain all my life i've been in mccain last 8 years uh, agriculture is a relatively new thing to me but what has truly surprised me is that the technology for any and every challenge does exist out there it's really how do you get it into the field and overcoming all kinds of constraints but if you get labored by the constraints it never will happen and i think the private sector is in a unique position and mccain in its very small way kind of gives a model because we just have directly worked with farmers to first demonstrate to them what good agricultural practices look like and then if they adopt it how can they thrive as farmers i earn more money in a predictable way and yet provide output which we can use to value add and you know we've done that irrigation is a big example i mean nobody in india was doing either drip or you know sprinkler for potato when mccain came in 20 years back it's the mccain system of you know creating uh you know this call it canadian indian collaboration of canadian inputs executed through a big panel of call them indian agriculturalists we have a team today of 35 agronomy people who work with close to 800 to 1000 farmers in uh, gujarat and that is the team which takes to them all the call it the farming practices around irrigation around now more recently we've started to make the farming community be aware about things like carbon emissions and you know what we may call it carbon emissions but instinctively each of the farmers have their own expression for how to look after the environment so it's not a new topic for them but you know as you begin to talk to them about it they they get it and the question is okay so what do we need to do and will we still earn enough and then as you do that conversation with them you can reach an outcome which is good for both so we are now beginning to do that work together with them i think the one area of technology adoption which 
is a struggle. Um, and I think uh, if there is a um, you know panel member here or elsewhere, if we can get into a right uh, way forward for that, is really the area of farm mechanization. Because that's an area which everyone does realize that is needed. Farmers are small and do not have the capital for it. But the companies that provide it as a service, they really haven't found a business model around it. And we have worked to try and connect the two a lot, but haven't really reached a sustainable way. Because I think if we are able to achieve that, then a lot of the discussion we've just had around precision agriculture will automatically be solved. Because once you do have that equipment on the field, then that equipment can do a lot for you. But currently the issue is that we are unable to get it there in a sustainable way. So we have a, you know, McCain is actually fairly committed and is doing it in uh, advanced markets. And we are actively considering it in India to create a demo farm. Because that's the way we taught our farmers in the beginning when we came on how to grow the right kind of potato. And that's the other initiative we are very committed to in India. That look, if there is a way we can demonstrate at a, you know, modal farm size, how new technology can work to combine productivity with sustainability, that will be great. We have the you know, commitment and the ability, and we are looking for solutions in terms of how to demonstrate that. So really, I mean, mitigating climate change through carbon emission control, more water, um, you know, we use the words enabling sustainable uh, water usage, then adopting new and innovative technology practices, and then thriving communities. Because eventually, all this, the end goal, you know, even if it's productivity or sustainability, the end goal really is in ensuring that the lives of the farmers are improved, because that is really when you make a meaningful difference uh, and a sustainable difference. So to put it again, you know, in a bit of a summary point, I think technology is available. Um, McCain has demonstrated in a small way uh, in the area we work in Gujarat in potatoes that with the right farmer connect, it is possible, even while you know the government changes or does not change its policy framework because that is still, you know, it takes time. We are seeing some positive, you know, trends in the government today. Uh, but, you know, there's political compulsions and this and that, and we don't really influence it. So what we do influence, if we can change, and maybe get together more as, you know, an industry to see where are really the areas we can get them unstuck. And honestly, I believe this whole farm mechanization, if that is an area, we can find good solutions for small farmers with small land holdings then the entire technology just opens up because then that equipment out there in the field can do so much more. Uh, we have begun, I mean, the last point I do want to highlight is the area of crop monitoring. That is also a bit like, uh, you know, done commonsensically, um, but with all the technology available today, you can almost peep into the farm as and when you want with whatever purpose you have. And we've again seen a little bit of education with the farmers. They're very quick to adopt things so they have a mobile phone. They may use it only for calling. But if you tell them, here are the various things we can do with your mobile phone, and I'm here to help you, they will adopt it pretty fast. Uh, I'd just like to share, we went to a field in Haryana, and the farmer, his vision there was really to run his entire farm with a laptop in a control room. Now, wow. Uh, you know, and it's not so difficult to create that kind of vision with support from a company like McCain or many others who are over here. Great. So thank you uh, so much and pleasure to be in a panel like this with uh, Dr. Gulati and, um, you know, to share, call it the optimistic thoughts of uh, it is possible with the right farmer connect uh, with getting a few things unstuck. Yep. Thank you, Vikas. Uh, uh, hopefully we can uh, revisit some of the points uh, that you just made. Uh, our final panelist is uh, Mark, and uh, he's going to talk to us about sustainable farming using green energy. Uh, is that right, uh, Mark? Did I say that right? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, so yeah, first off, I'm certainly honored to be part of this conversation. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here listening to all the speakers and I couldn't agree more with all the points they're making. And, and I, and I kind of think I'd like to, uh, I'd just like to start off by, instead of giving my perspective, just give a bit of an experience of, of how, uh, how our company has gotten involved with the agricultural sector. Uh, and that was back in 2016. I, uh, I had met with a farmer uh, at his kitchen table and he was, he was telling me uh, 
how he can't sell his product for for any more money. He can't make any more money on it. Uh, so he, he really wanted to find ways that he could reduce his expenses. And he saw that as really the only opportunity that he could uh, provide a, a sustainable business for uh, for his children to pass on to his kids. Uh, so that that kind of that kind of conversation is how I first got in, involved in and in kind of understanding of of how renewable energy can play a really important role in offering that uh, uh, that sustainable energy component to firms. And and when I say that, I mean it more in terms of of providing. Uh, a secured outlook on what energy costs will be for firms. So essentially, what we're able to do with uh, with renewable energy is is secure that that lifetime cost of energy uh, for a known amount. Uh, another way to look at that is they're they're kind of pre pre purchasing their their energy by simply growing it themselves uh, on a firm. Uh, now, what I guess one of the plugins, <laughs> what I want to say is how uh, how I think that we're becoming or, or we have a lot to to uh, contribute to this uh, uh, to this industry is with our own experience in renewable energy and uh, especially coming from little New Brunswick uh, where when the farmer first asked us uh, to help them with this uh, we we also were young and, and small and we needed to uh, uh, to learn what to do what we could provide them so we also reached outside of our province and outside of our country uh, and brought back the uh, the parts to build a, a solar array. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, I'm just being really open book uh, that we built half of the project during that first phase. And for anybody that's familiar with New Brunswick, we have a term uh, called the nor'easter winds. So these are really strong winds that blow up through our province. Uh, and we found that the, the structure that we had built and the design for the solar array couldn't withstand this kind of harsh environment. Now, the reason I say that, and I think it's it's important and this is key is that uh, I, everyone on uh, certainly on this on this panel couldn't uh, can truly say that we're not sure what the future of our environment looks like, uh, in, in terms of you know the extreme elements that that will, uh, farms are subjected to. Uh, so just speaking on the energy side alone, we need to build for that kind of uh, unpredictable future. Uh, so I think New Brunswick becomes a really good benchmark if if we can build something to withstand. Uh, our kind of winds and our kind of snow load, our kind of environment, then we're certainly building something that we can we can ship to India and withstand uh, potential future, uh, you know, heavy heavy climate. Uh, so we've we've created a a product and, and we call it the Nor'easter. Uh, we call it Nor'easter Micro Solar Farm, and that's the next piece of my plugin. Is that we also found there wasn't any uh, full turnkey solution for the medium-sized energy users where farmers typically fall into. Uh, and that's important also to point out that there's a lot of focus and solutions for large, large utility size uh, businesses and, and companies. Uh, and also in the renewable space, a lot of focus on the residential and small sector. Uh, so we quickly found that our business fit well in trying to service that medium-sized uh, energy space. Uh, so beyond the the uh, advantages of solar and uh, and generating electricity uh, on the farm, and also having the data now to show that uh, farmers are able to produce their own electricity on site, uh, not just for less cost, but certainly uh, more secure in terms of having to rely on outside sources of electricity. Uh, so since we've since we've done that back in 2016, uh, we we have been working with several other firms across New Brunswick. Uh, and now we have six farms that are all uh, considered net zero energy. And, and what that means is that they're producing as much electricity as they would typically consume. Uh, and now what we're also kind of uncovering is some really neat side effects of that with uh, farmers beginning to realize uh, that agri-tech and all these technologies that we talk about, they really have a common denominator and that is electricity. And when when farmers are exploring their potential or their options for for these new technologies uh they in fact i kind of think this is similar to uh if anyone on, on in this panel has bought an electric vehicle uh when you go to buy an electric vehicle you you don't just learn about one product uh you're actually learning about all of the other aspects that plug into that that product so for an electric vehicle it's uh public electric charging stations then you're going to look at uh, a charging station for your home and then it's going to take you in to start understanding and learning about the cost of electricity and what electricity is 
and the impact it might have. So that's just kind of a, an analogy I wanted to lay out that I think that offering any kind of uh, solution in the agri-tech or renewables field allows for more awareness and more education to be done. Uh, and it's a shining example of what's happening here in, in our province uh, with now having those six farms net zero. Uh, one of the farms is actually net positive, which means it's producing more energy uh, than it than it uses. And so I think that uh, I think that our our our, uh, our association with the farming industry is uh, is certainly going to grow, and we're positioning ourselves to to learn more and understand more. And we're also doing the same thing. We're challenging ourselves to to learn more and meet with more uh, with other manufacturers that are perhaps in, in the same parallels with, uh, and especially as all these new exciting technologies come out, I'm always so fascinated with them. Uh, and as uh, I think it was Mike, why well, was just saying how you can take a, a, you know, USB stick and plug it into a tractor and, and have that farm work so much more efficiently by having that tractor go to the places that it needs to. Uh, and then obviously the next step is fully autonomous with, uh, you know, that tractor being electric and it being, uh, a, a smart tractor uh, and the same with the laptop you can plug a laptop in and run your whole farm so i really see a lot of uh, symmetry between uh, all of this focus and, and technologies and all these companies so again thanks very much for letting me put my little my little pitch in and i'd, I'd happy to answer any questions from new brunswick yep thank, thank you mark really appreciate it uh, completely different perspective um I think we are going to uh, be a little over already, uh, more than a little over, uh, because of uh, how uh, the inaugural session got delayed. I was given until 9.15, but uh, we are over that by a few minutes. Uh, but if it's okay with uh, Dr. Uh, Gulati, I'd like to loop back on a couple of points that uh, others have made, starting with uh, Mike, uh, in terms of uh, the subsidies, uh, can uh, do you would you recommend and do you think it's practical for the subsidies to move from the inputs to the mechanization that uh, uh, Vikas also mentioned? Well, there is a lot of uh, communication to be done that instead of uh, variable inputs every year you move the subsidies towards what we call the investment subsidies, right? This is a permanent uh, booster of productivity, reducing your uh, costs, making you more competitive, uh, and uh, not allowing misuse uh, and environmentally damaging, uh, you know, inputs like uh, cheap fertilizers and all. I mean, just to give you uh, one little example, if you subsidize drip with fertigation, then you increase the nutrient use efficiency from 20-30% to 90%. So actually that capital subsidy you give on the drips and uh, the machinery for fertigation, you recover within two years, three years, uh, all the subsidies you are spending in wasteful of uh, you know granular fertilizer which they are uh, broadcasting uh, just throwing in the field so uh, but there has to be a good amount of uh, communication that needs to be done but i would like to say something what uh, mark uh, talked about uh, on the renewables we have not explored the you know prime minister has kept a target of 100 gigawatt solar power in the country now, the model they are following is, okay, invite solar parks, a big industry, and, uh, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of acres on which it can be put. Now, that land is gone for the next 20 years. Nothing at its end to be done. Of having at four feet high, feet high, what you can do That photosynthesis can be done and the surplus energy that is being generated throughout the year besides the two crops that he can have with now more assured irrigation this solar tree actually is a third crop and you can have you know uh, 400 uh, plus trees 
uh, I have been working with Delhi government uh, on one pilot and they are able to announce 1 lakh rupees per acre as an additional income to the farmer and the investment is to be done by somebody else. It is only farmer's land to be used. Only thing he has to sign on is that for 25 years, he will not approve these solar trees in his farm. So I think we have to be innovative in a manner which promotes sustainability, increases his income, and inclusive in nature, because we are a country of small holders, not uh, very big holders. So I think sky is the limit. Uh, we need to work more towards uh, policies and innovations, uh, which will give sustainability, high productivity, and higher incomes. Yep. Th thank you, Dr. Gulati. Uh, any uh, closing comments from anyone else on the panel? I think, Vasan, time permitting, we should take clo closing comments from each of the panelists. Each of them uh -huh. has such fabulous points of view that we are, uh, you know, totally, um, totally in uh, interested in what they have to say. So maybe a minute each for all of them. Sure. Uh, uh, Vikas, do you want to start out? <laughs> No, no, very much so. I mean, um, what I'd really say as a summary point is, um, you know, productivity and sustainability have to move together. Solutions on sustainability, honestly, are known to everyone. So to the point that uh, Dr. Gulati made, what's the kind of communication that can happen? You know, one is with the government. And that by definition and nature will take long. But can there be a, a communication within the industry? where we kind of pool our um, knowledge, resources, uh, in a way that we can enable the environment to move towards what we already know is a sustainable future, which interestingly will honestly improve productivity. They are not working against each other. They are working with each other. Yep. Thank you. Uh, Mike? Yeah, well, I, I've really enjoyed the conversation um, and uh, thank you very much for, for including um, including us. Uh, I guess what I would say is that, that, that what we're seeing at Nutrien is a remarkable, remarkable uh, level of progress when it comes to digital adoption um, at the farm level, precision agriculture. It's just absolutely remarkable. And, um, you know, there's a lot that's being learned. Um, and there, you know, you, you know, things that are working and things that aren't working. Um, but there's a lot that's being learned very, very quickly. And I hope that we can take some of the conversation today and continue to have the conversation because, you know, it, it would be a shame for all this great content to be left um, without action. Um, because the time for action is now. The technology exists. The needs are there. We have to protect um, our environment. We need to feed the world. There is a way that, that both of those things can happen together. Um, but it's going to be enabled by technology and a lot of smart people that are on the on this call today taking action to get um, not only our governments, but our farmers and everything in between on board and aligned towards that. But, uh, thank you very much for including us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Pramod? Yeah, well, so, so uh, I think more conversations are needed. Uh, what these reforms recently have done is that it's brought a, put, put back a lot of focus on agriculture and farmers. Everybody is talking about them. Uh, it's become a, a fairly debated topic uh, in India right now. And, uh, and I think that to sustain that interest, right? So be it in the consumer level, uh, be it the, you know, the companies like ours, uh, I think, and, you know, we need to tap in expertise wherever it is, right? So with, be it in the tech sector, within the country, outside the country, and make a lot of those things happen. Uh, as many panelists have mentioned, solutions are out there. We just need to figure out the right way to get it adopted, uh, you know, economic way to adopt it so that it becomes a bit more sustainable. Uh, I agree to, you know, uh, Vikas' point as well, uh, in terms of, you know, we should not let everything be dependent on the government. And I think I think it's time to, you know, uh, share a bit of that load and make things work for our farmers and I think uh, and finally, uh, Mark, uh, you you can start thinking about uh, solar trees now in New Brunswick. 
Uh, yes, yeah, I mean, <laughs> certainly. Uh, I, I kind of echo in the same comments. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I feel really privileged to be part of this conversation, and I think that I think that we, we share a lot of similarities in terms of barriers uh, that we can perhaps overcome with with regulatory environment. Uh, and I think that something kind of rang rang with me with one of the firms saying that uh, if we take care of our lands and our environment, then our environment will take care of the the farmers, and then our farmers can take care of us. So I, I really see this perfect cycle. Uh, and I'm, I'm quite inspired to see so much effort in, in, uh, uh, from all of these businesses uh, and all the businesses that are part of this agri sector uh, coming together and collaborating and sharing information and seeing what ways we can do to offer these kind of solutions. So uh, hats off to everybody on this call. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, panelists. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> the expectations were high uh, for uh, this panel, and uh, I think we certainly delivered. Thank you very much. Uh, Nadira, any closing comments from you before we wrap up? Uh, no, I think this was a very a fabulous panel. And thank you to all the panelists and Dr. Gulati for making this so interesting. Uh, I just want to reassure uh, Mike, uh, who said that uh, this should not be in vain, that everyone here, Vikas, Mike, Mark, all everybody has given such and Pramod have given good inputs and insights that uh, but uh, so i just want to reassure that we will not let it go in vain we will pick up this we will further this conversation uh, keep maybe a very focused session on sustainability because uh, as was said that if we take care of the environment then the environment takes care of farmers and the farmers take care of us so it is a cycle that we want to have continue and we will do so Thank you, everybody, for this wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, we will be recording the session. We will share it with you, and we will ask for more comments so that uh, you know, may, uh, and maybe plan some more follow-ups of this conversation so that it's not a conversation; it is translated into action. Uh, yep. Thank you very much, Vasant, for having conducted this brilliant uh, session, and we look forward to uh, all of you joining us tomorrow for the second day session. I'm sure you all will find it informative and interesting. We as we did today, uh, 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And hopefully tomorrow we end at 9 o'clock on time. <laughs> I have kept you all waiting. Thank you for your patience, all of you. And good night. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vasan. Thank you, Nadara. Thank, Thank you, Vikas. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.